Standing performance from the one. See Bob Cycles and Fair Oaks for Citrus Heights Cycle Re and Citrus Heights. Live at the 1980 World Cycling Championship, the professional road race. A group of 11 riders had escaped for a couple of laps. The field, however, is chasing very, very hard right now. The front of the main peloton that we're looking at right now is Doug Shapiro of the United States from Dix Hills, New York, a very fine uh, American rider. Yeah. So they're coming through again. Once again, okay. there's 11 riders who are broken away, and these, this pack of... I don't know how many is in this group. It's quite a large group at this point. It's chasing them, and it's coming down to the wire here at the World Championships. With a serious chase mounted right now by virtually all of the teams, uh, even though, Connie, most of the teams are represented in the breakaway, and normally you would see defensive riding by teammates, what I believe is happening is that if we can liken a team to an army, it's the foot soldiers that have done the battling so far. Now the generals are getting into the fray. Well, you can really see that now as they move to the front. They realize they only have a little more than a lap and a half to go. We're getting into the long descent on the course. And, and really, there's only two more times up the long climb, and they really have to think about doing something now. This is Bernard Hinault, who was our pre-race favorite, of course, uh, won the Tour de France five times. He really wants to win here. Right behind him, one of the Belgian team riders, and now Greg LeMond. If you've got to look at favorites, Greg LeMond of the United States is right in the thick of things, sitting fourth in that chase, so the big names are definitely at the front making the race right now in the final two laps. You see Greg LeMond tightening his toe straps, moving up to the front. Looks like he's getting ready to do something here next time they come around. You can see the Air Force Academy, the whole campus behind the, uh, the descent here where the riders are racing. They're on a downhill stretch right there, which is why they don't appear to be pedaling. We're talking about them chasing hard, and yet they're coasting down the hill. The riders in the back doing uh, coasting while up front they they uh, would would appear to be pedaling. Here on this descent, now the Dutch team has gone to the front. They've got a man in the break. Theo de Roy of Holland is in that 11-rider group that's ahead of this main field that we're looking at. Connie, how much psyching goes on out there? You saw Lamont come up on Eno and just sort of pass him for a little bit, move him around. It looks like he was just trying to show up. Yeah, I'm still here. Don't, uh, don't forget about me. Boy, when you're in a, in a pack like that, you try to pretend like you're not tired, you're fresh. You, you, give a, you give kind of a posture to the other riders to let them think that you're really feeling good. And, and yet, at the same time, you don't want to give too much away. It's uh, a lot of psyching at the, end of the, in the, at the end of a race like this. In the lead group here that you see, there's a lot of that going on. They have to work together. They have to keep taking their turn at the front to keep the speed up. But at the same time, they don't want to spend themselves too completely because they want to have enough to win the sprint at the end. Bruce, certainly you ran alongside somebody in a 10,000 meters and huffed and puffed to pretend like you were tired and then blew past the guy with a lap to go. Is something going to be similar to that up on the hill? Uh, no. I think a little bit of it, but... Actually, I was huffing and puffing and I was really tired, you know, but uh, I didn't want to let them to know, so I ran like I wasn't tired. But I can see how there is a lot of psyche in this, because this is such a long event. You figure it's going to go about six and a half hours that you might as well do things out there and sort of play with each other's minds. The breakaway group here on screen, I couldn't help but noticing the look on Rolf Gultz there, the, uh, the German rider who was at the front of the field in that last shot. He is serious. These riders are kind of in a way, Connie, caught between a rock and a hard place. While their assignment might have been to, uh, to do some foot soldiering for their team captains, they see the possibility of a gold medal and, a, and one of those coveted rainbow jerseys here. So while they think they might be getting caught, uh, they're going to keep working as well. Well, and you know what else, Brian? If the pack continues to sit here and wait, which they look like they're doing right now, time will suddenly be quite will slip right away from them and and there won't be any time left and those 11 riders will be out in front and you know we've got on people looking at a sprint for a victory here so it's uh, it's not a bad group of riders up there uh, from the u.s standpoint for sure ron people's proven he can win international races like this we're beginning to see the water bottles shed out of the field there as they take on a new fresh water bottle full of uh, fluids or full of some sort of uh, perhaps what, what do they drink uh, different things for different situations uh, i would think something with some sugar in it, a little energy, a little quick boost right now is what they're going to be looking at. In a long race like this, they do drink a lot of electrolyte replacement type drinks. They do eat some food while they're riding. They drink water. And toward the end of the race, they mix a little Coke with water, too, to uh, just for that extra sugar, like you say. This is our breakaway group, number 105 there, Charlie Motte of France in the, in the tricolor jersey. Here's the uh, Galtz uh, of Germany. So we've swing through the breakaway group right now. There's Mate of France, Galtz of Germany, and uh, on the back is the Swede, Stefan Brick, wearing the uh, 
sort of folded up number 235. They have a number on the frame there that you can also see. As we see this chase going on here, the group seems to be stringing out and everybody following in there. Tony, how close are these bikes to the bikes that you go down to your store and buy? I mean, are they that trick? How important is the equipment than the rider? Well, the equipment that these riders race on certainly is very functional, but it's also very lightweight. Uh, it's not that much different than, a, you know, your your 10 speed that you think about, although they have 14 speeds. The bikes probably weigh about 18 pounds. They're very efficient. The gears work very efficiently. The riders are very aware of their gears, and uh, they're very comfortable on their bikes. They're very well fitted to their bikes, and even though they're out there working very hard, they can actively recover while on the bike because they're, they're very relaxed when they do ride. You can see Ron Kiefel right there relaxing after he's done some work at the front trying to recover, trying to keep rested because he's looking at uh, trying to get through the next lap up ahead. He's looking back now to see how far ahead they are. Keep in mind they've already ridden over 140 miles, so they're <laughs> going to start putting on those ugly pirate faces here pretty soon. There's one of the support cars for the U.S. professional team, the U.S. pro team led, if you will, by Greg LeMond, but at this point, it's Ron Kiefel that's in the driver's seat in terms of uh, an American's chances. He's in that breakaway while LeMond is in the main field. Anytime you bring together a fantastic field like this, all the best riders from all over the world, you can expect surprises, and I think we're seeing a bit of a surprise right now by seeing the group out in front that is out in front. Uh, Stefan Bricht from Sweden is the youngest rider in that breakaway group. He's only 22 years old. A little bit of jocularity going on. Uh, a couple of the Belgian riders sharing a bit of a smile right there. They have a rider in the breakaway, uh, Nico Edmonds, Emmons. And uh, so the teams that are not represented in that 11 rider breakaway are the ones that have to take their time cards and punch in and go to work, while the teams that do have a rider in the breakaway can sit back and force the chase to be made by teams that need to get up there. See Rolf Goltz of West Germany working hard there. Stefan Brick. We're going to be right back to the 1986 World Cycling Championships in Colorado Springs right after these messages. The essence of Scully. Never been a hull like this. So trim. Feels like there's nothing between me and the water. The essence of Shavy. This is new micro truck. The incredible new disposable from Gillette. Unlike the big shaver, micro truck has a slim head and shaves your beard closer. The new Microtrack Razor by Gillette. Hello, hi. Hey, how are you? Six years ago, Win T. Waugh came to America with a cardboard suitcase and a dream. She learned a new language, new customs. She learned that here, hard work is recognized and rewarded. And she learned that in America, dreams can come true. So today, she took the day off to attend a reunion with the children she was forced to leave behind six years ago. At 7-Eleven, we think everyone should remember that America is a country built by immigrants to the wind. And to all the new Americans who've become part of our family, we say, welcome. We're back live at the 1986 World Cycling Championships, the professional road race. Again, a group of 11 riders had been away. It looks like that breakaway is starting to come apart as the riders in that group are fighting each other. Here we see the Italian Moreno Argentine, who had been uh, really among some of the European press, one of the real favorites in this race. And also the, the Frenchman, number 99, Laurent Fignon. And Rolf Goltz is also in there of uh, West Germany. Of course, he's the Olympic silver medalist. You know, uh, the Italians were, the Italian press was saying that uh, Marina Argentine had been near the finish, I mean, at the front, near the finish of the World Championship Road Race a couple of years, and they really expected to see him do something here. This year, he was third in last year's World Championships. Our motorcycle cameras are out there right with the racers and you can see that the perspective that's uh, given by those cameras here you can see that we have two riders chasing three riders and you can actually see the physical distance in between them not more than maybe 50 yards how tough is it once you get out of that pack how tough is it to get back in especially if you're individual or maybe just two guys like this how tough is it for them to catch up 
Well, of course, at this point in the game, everybody's uh, pretty tired and they're giving the, the most that they can. And what's happening in the lead group is that you're getting attacks out of that group, trying to break it up, trying to sort out the sprinters. And everybody's making their bid now to keep this breakaway away. So it's very hard. They're, they're riding almost as hard as they can right now to catch those leaders, not let them out of their sight. Any hesitation at this point could be the end of the race. They appear to be pedaling very slowly, but Connie, you and I both know that they've got it in a huge gear. I mean, these guys are uh, literally on a 10-speed in 10th gear. They're on a 14-speed in 14th gear right now, doing everything they can to maintain a speed, probably in excess of 30 miles an hour, even on the flats. Yeah, they're working up at the top of the hill now, and you can see the look in their faces. They're working very hard. They're grimacing. They're, they're giving all they can. They sit up on the top of the handlebars so they can breathe better, but they look very smooth. You can tell that these gentlemen ride a lot of miles. Very aerodynamic uh, looking trio right there as they've formed a temporary partnership, if you will. How many miles do you have to train, Connie, to uh, be in an event like this? Many of these riders will train as much as 700 miles in a week. That's 100 miles a day, and it's no wonder that they're professionals. It's a full-time job. You're watching KSCH TV 58, Stockton, Sacramento. This blue with vertical stripes on it. Rolf Galt in the white in the West German uniform. And the third member of that uh, trio right there is uh, Charlie Maffei of France, number 105. We'll see a picture of him. We saw a picture of him a moment ago. Connie, how's it make you feel having the World Championships here, really, right in your home state, not only in your home country? Well, it's a wonderful opportunity for all the U.S. riders, and you can see that it's helping Ron Kiefel today. Although the weather is really in the Europeans' favor, it's uh, kind of cool and overcast, but I think we have a pretty good crowd out here, considering the weather, and, and it's just exciting to have it here in America. A temporary partnership is really what happens in a bicycle race. Three different teams, three different nations, three individuals each wanting to win the gold medal. But what they must do before they get within a few hundred yards or whatever of the finish line is that they must agree to work together so that they have effectively now increased their chances of winning this race instead of one in 141. 141 riders started this race at uh, face value with an equal chance of winning. These three now, if the race were to end within moments, would have a one in three chance each of taking that gold medal. They've agreed to work together for that purpose. They're entering the roller coaster section of the course. Now there's a steep little downhill followed by a sharp upgrade, and then they start coming into the finish area again. These riders definitely need to continue to work together to maintain their distance. They know they have a big pack that's thundering to catch them, you know. It's, uh, it's not going to be an easy task to stay away for that final lap. We're getting pictures here of the leaders, the lead trio, and, our, and from helicopters and motorcycles, a combination of, uh, of, of viewpoints here. And uh, I think our, the cameramen are doing an excellent job of really giving us the perspective not only of what the racers are going through, but really when they pull back from one of those long shots here, they're just behind the lead three riders. So we have a motorcycle cameraman in between the front three and whoever might be behind them. I feel like we're number four in the pack there, uh, holding on. It's really one of the things I think, Connie, the riders become accustomed to having the motorcycles around. I think people maybe unaccustomed to seeing this might say, you know, get that motorcycle out of there. Professional motorcycle drivers and cameramen are a part of a racing like this, helping us bring it to the people who are watching. We're starting to head into the steep upgrade now, and, and I think we talked about this hill earlier as well, Brian, that this would be a, a hill that would really be painful toward the end of the race. It's very steep, but it's also very short. And at this point in the race, it's hard for the riders to keep their rhythm. There's a shot of the, uh, the turn at the bottom of the long descent. You can see we're running at over six hours of racing so far. That's Moreno, Argentine of Italy, who we had mentioned already many times that uh, was one of the favorites, especially among the, obviously, among the Italian press. You can see them grimacing up this hill. Maltais particularly, the Frenchman. Here comes the chase now. You can see that it's really virtually no time in between, just a, a, a handful of seconds here between the group that just went by, and this is the group of uh, three riders chasing them. Significantly in this group of three is the blonde uh, Frenchman with the headband on. That's Laurent Fignon, who was the 1984 Tour de France champion. He's had an off year, and uh, we'll be right back to these championships, the World Cycling Championships, after these messages from our local stations. Timing 
is everything. The right place at the right time. Northern California, we've got your number. 2.9% factory financing on any Oldsmobile for 36 months. 4.8% factory financing on any Oldsmobile for 48 months. Or $1,500 cash back on Toronado. $750 cash back on 88s and 98. 500 cash back on all other new 86 cars. Timing has never been better, Northern California. We've got your number. I am here to make a pitch for Sun Country Peach. Why me? Because I'm crazy about the taste of peach. And Sun Country Wine Cooler is the most refreshing blend of premium wine and real peach juice I've ever pitched. It has such a great taste. It's how you say it? Peachy, peachy! Sun Country. Say, give me the real juice cooler. You know, I don't mind doing coochie coochie in a bear suit, but it's so peachy, peachy. Caramba, me está matando tantas hormigas dentro de los pantalones. We're back live at the 1986 World Cycling Championships Professional Road Race. We're coming up on the final bell, the one lap to go signal, and now all of the early going means nothing. One lap to go, it is crunch time. One lap to go, that's nine and a half miles, another 580 feet of climbing. And for these racers, they've gone 150 miles. It's been a lot of work done so far, and it's really all coming down to this last lap. We're looking at Moreno Argentine of Italy, who's sit first place. He's been riding very strongly throughout. He looks to be a strong favorite here now at this point in the race. There it is, the bell right there. One lap to go for the three leaders. One lap to go for the three chasing riders who are just 100, 200 yards maximum behind that lead trio. We're looking at a six-rider race right now. Looking at Rolf Goltz from West Germany. The rest of the riders hear the bell. Really got to put, give them goosebumps to know they have just one lap to go. It's ex really exciting to come down to the World Championship and be there at the front and, and know that you, you can't, they can't afford to make a mistake at this point in the race. They have to be thinking very clearly despite being extremely tired. One lap to go, the bell gives you an adrenaline rush and it also tells you that it, it's now or never. It really takes a lot of concentration to ride a race of this duration, to ride a race that will last over six hours. The remaining four riders of that original 11 coming by right now, led by number 23, Nico Emmons of Belgium. And uh, so that 11 rider breakaway that we had with three laps to go in the race has now become fractured apart into a group of three, another group of three, and the remaining five or six riders, including Ron Keefel of the United States. At this point, the, the big pack that's chasing these, these leaders is about a minute and 20, a minute and 25 seconds behind. It's not inconceivable that, that they can't catch them in this last lap, but it would take a lot of work, a lot of teamwork among the riders in that group to go after it. Greg LeMond is leading the chase from the pack, but it's, uh, at this point, it's Charlie Mote and uh, Rolf Goltz and Moreno Argentine who are working very well together and looking at the top three spots right now. They are the story. It is still... Uh, really anyone's bike race with less than two minutes separating the the first place rider from all of the contenders including Bernardino, Greg Lamont, uh, Sean Kelly and the rest that we introduced at the start of the show. It really is anybody's bike race in this last lap. That's not a big enough lead to be significant. You can see Greg Lamont right now up at the front uh, just catching Ron Kiefel who has been reabsorbed. He was in that breakaway group for a few laps. And they made a bid on his part to do well here, but now it's Greg LeMond taking over the chase. He knows it's now or never, and he wants to be up there. He wants to be up there with those leaders. If the race were to end right now, the best Greg LeMond could do is seventh. He's got to move up past six riders to take the gold medal. That's Charlie Motte of France. Charlie Motte had a few good days in the Tour de France this year. He's a very strong rider, very well liked in Europe. He's young. He's only 23 years old. He won the Grand Prix of Nations last year, so he's proven he too can win big bicycle races. That lead trio of riders ahead of our camera motorcycle as they're climbing through the academy now. They'll begin a descent. They'll get a little bit of relief here for just a few minutes, if nothing else. These riders are giving 110% right now. They really want to stay away, and they know they're not that far ahead. But it's the only thing they can do is, is just to put their heads down and work together and try to get to the finish line in front of that big chasing pack. Nine more miles. That's your silver. We just don't know what order or whether that'll be the case. 
I noticed when Greg Lamont went by the finish line and started to make his move, he kept looking over his shoulder. He was almost looking for somebody to go with him to help him out to try to make that run. Greg Lamont would have a hard time bridging a gap like this on his own. He needs some help. He needs some other strong riders because, as I said before, it's more efficient to sit behind. You need that rest to get behind the other riders and take your turn at the front. Actually, you can see right here the difference. Look at the front rider working very hard, and the back rider was just barely moving his leg. He was sitting there, back there, relaxing. Rolf Galt there in the white jersey, over medalist in the Olympic Games, behind America's Steve Hague in a very short track event. He's made a nice transition to a 162-mile road race. Rolf Galt is a very fast rider, and he's showing he has good endurance today. You can see him there working very smoothly, very strongly. Moreno Argentine looks very, very smooth as well. These riders are, are really looking for uh, to try to increase the gap as much as possible, but now you see Charlie Motte just staying in the back. He doesn't want to go to the front and help them work. That's going to slow down their efforts. I was going to say, how much does it affect them I'm trying to think, okay, I don't want to take the lead on the final lap. I'm just not going to do it. Let you guys do all the work. I'll sit back here so I'll be fresh. And you can see the distance between that group and now the back group of three, and then we have the big pack behind that. Well, you know, I tell you what's happening here is that Argentine and Galtz must work together. Moté looks back and he sees Laurent Fignon chasing. Fignon is a Frenchman, and he's also his system U teammate. So he thinks, aha, if Fignon can catch me and, and go with me, I'll have an advantage because I'll have a teammate. That forces these two to do the work, and it makes it a lot more difficult. He has the luxury right now of knowing that he has a teammate coming up. How upset do the other two riders get if the one guy is sitting in the back and not helping? Well, again, you're talking about the mind games that they play. Argentine knows he has to work at this point. He can't sit up and say, I'm not going to work either because he wants to stay away. It's very frustrating, but it's part of the game, and cycling is a, is a very big tactical game, and especially when you come down to the end of a long race like this. Our lead trio, it's a short way to go, but it's a long way to go. And there's the, the chase. And uh, the American Stars and Stripes jersey at the front of a long single file line of riders going on a descent, a very fast part of the race course. Ron Kiefel was in that breakaway and was caught. That is him at the head of the field right there. Make We're going to be coming back to the 1986 World Cycling Championships in Colorado Springs, Colorado, right after these messages from our local stations. We're back live at the 1986 World Cycling Championships Professional Road Race. I'm Brian Drever, working with Olympic champions Bruce Jenner and Connie Carpenter Finney. Our lead trio of riders, Rolf Galtz from West Germany, Moreno Argentine of Italy, and Charlie Motte of France. In that order, those three riders out in front of everybody else at this point in the final lap of the World Championships. The riders have just come down the long descent. You can see this is a nice perspective because you see there's three chasers coming up. And behind them is a very large pack, still chasing, still, still, giving, still holding out the hope that they can catch these six riders who are out in front. That's, uh, you can see right there, maybe 100 yards and only a handful of seconds at this point. The three leaders, Argentina in the front working, Rolf Goltz in the white jersey of Germany working, Charlie Motte really just taking a sleigh ride right now because he's got a teammate, Lauren Fignon, who is chasing. He's not going to do much to help this breakaway. He has already done quite a bit to help that breakaway. And we'd like to see Lauren Fignon in the middle right there. That's his teammate. So we have two Frenchmen who uh, could combine forces right now. If Fignon's little group of three here on the screen catches the lead group of three, that would put Fignon and Motte at uh, a two-man advantage in this six-man group. Motte seems to be in the best position right now because he is running in the lead group, and he's been running easily for the last half a lap. He obviously has to have a lot of energy left. Uh, yeah, I think he really is in a good position. That's a good point to bring up, Bruce, because 
he, he's, he has a luxury right now of knowing his teammate is back there. He knows Laurent Fignon is coming up. He wants him to catch him. He doesn't want to be caught by this big pack of riders, but he does want that little chasing group of three to catch him. He'll have a little help. There is teamwork. There is tactics in cycling that is somewhat difficult to explain, but we see a good example right now of how these two riders, uh, Moreno Argentine and Rolf Goltz, must keep the pace up, and Mote can sit back and hope that his teammate comes up to him or sit back and hope that if they get close close enough to the finish line he would be the fresher of the three as, as you might as you alluded to bruce and uh with that freshness be able to sprint past the other two at the finish line it's still a long way to go to that finish line however there are less than a half a lap uh, uh, more than a half a lap to go less than a half of a lap into this race and the long climb and that little short killer hill where i think the hammer's going to drop Tony, i think you and i agreed on that the hammer's going to drop on that little hill a mile to a mile and a half from the finish you know, it's really hard to know what's in the minds of the riders right now. Of course, they're thinking about the finish. They want to get to the finish line. They want to be fresh at the finish line. Most of all, they want to stay away from that large chasing pack. But what, what is uh, Rolf Gold thinking now? Is he thinking, I'm too tired to sprint? I have to try to get away from these other two? Or does he think, I can win, these, win this sprint? I can beat these riders. I've beaten them before. You know, it's hard to know. Every rider's mind is full of thoughts right now, and they must focus and intensely concentrate on what they're doing. Now, what's the Italian? Looks like one of the coaches talking to him, telling him what's going on at that point. Well, uh, the coach is probably coming up and telling Argentine how much time they have, who exactly is chasing, uh, how, how far the big pack is behind, and maybe he's telling him to cool it a little bit and not work too hard. Save yourself for the sprint. Don't give everything now. We want you to be world champion, not third, as he was last year. What do you consider the sprint? How, how much is the sprint? The last half mile, the last mile on this course? I would say this, the sprint per se is going to be the last uh, couple of hundred yards, this last little climb, maybe even less than 200 yards. Anyone in contact, anyone in contention is, uh, is going to have to come down to it in that last couple of hundred yards. Here you see uh, Rudy Altic, who was a famous West German rider and who is the coach of the West German team, come up to talk with Rolf Goltz, Goltz to tell him what's going on. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it looks like he's giving him a lot of encouragement. He's telling him he's got to go for it. This is it. It's on the line. Rolf Goltz came to America for the Olympics in 1984 and was very disappointed to lose to Steve Haig, to our American Steve Haig. And uh, he's been really proving himself as a professional. He made the transition from the amateur ranks to the professional ranks. and. He's showing it today. He's a fantastic athlete. That, that clenched fist just leaves nothing to the imagination. We'll be back to the World Cycling Championships Professional Road Race right after these messages. Professional Road Race is in its final lap, in its final 10 minutes, if you will, at this point, after they have been racing better than six hours right now. And we have right here Rolf Goltz, who has apparently come out of contact with the other two breakaway teammates that he had. They are on a climb right now. It, it, this is a long ascent here. This is where your legs feel like they have daggers in them. This is the last climb. It's a long one, as you say, and Rolf Goltz is, is struggling up. You can see he's weaving a little bit. He's trying to keep the pressure on so he doesn't lose too much of a contact with this group. But Argentine looks really smooth at the front. The Italian is really proving that he's one of the strongest riders in the world right now. And Charlie Motte, of course, has been kind of resting, riding behind, and he looks strong as well. This is a situation where Argentine is going to just keep pressure on the pedals and hope that whatever happens, happens behind him, that the others won't be able to keep his pace. He's been successful in shedding Rolf Goltz of Germany, and uh, while Motte here, sitting in second position behind Moreno Argentine, number 164 there, Motte has been taking a sleigh ride. He's got a little more left, obviously, than Goltz has, because Goltz is, uh, as we can see right here, 50, 75, maybe 100 meters behind. Say Moreno Argentina is, is probably telling Charlie Motte to help him out now to get to the front. It's a world championship. Let's go. But but again, Charlie Motte knows he has a teammate, Laurent Fignon, who's chasing him. He wouldn't mind if he caught up. But at this point, it's pretty good odds. He's going to be first or second. He should work. They should continue to keep the pace up and stay away to the finish. You could paint 100 different scenarios with just two riders right now. It seems like the pack, which is way far behind at this point, just didn't make their move early enough, did they? I don't know, Connie. I think we could probably divide camp on this and say that, well, maybe they feel like they still have enough time. There's certainly strength in numbers back there in that pack. If any one team or any couple of teams gets together and tries to start a chase, they certainly have strength in numbers right now. Here are four riders who are obviously trying to 
to get a, a chase going of some kind. They are also on the ascent. They can see the leaders on this long, tremendously straight uphill climb. I don't think anybody's catching uh, Morena Argentine and Charlie Morte at this point. Uh, I think that in terms of, of waiting too long, yeah, they certainly did. The 11 riders snuck off the front. They uh, worked very well together, and then suddenly that group of 11 started to shatter as the riders reached different fatigue levels and, and saturation points, if you will, with the race itself. It's a long race. It's 162 miles, and it's amazing when you look at these two riders. They really do look remarkably fresh after riding uh, for almost six and a half hours. Argentine looks very smooth, very competent, and uh, he's obviously been very effective so far. Marino keeps looking back and waiting. Here's the pack as they're working up that same hill. But here's Marino with the lead. He's looking back over his shoulder, waiting well, for Charlie to say, come on, Charles, you know, let's, uh, let's get this thing moving. He wants Motte to come to the front. He doesn't want to pull Motte all the way into the finish line and then get beaten. He, there's no uh, prestige in being second at the World Championships. It's, it's to win this event, to, to be able to wear the rainbow striped jersey, which is the official World Champions jersey. They get to wear that all next year. And uh, it's, there's so much prestige in this race. It's all or nothing now. This is a large hill. Can you make up more time on the hills or on the downhill portions? A small group can't make much time on a big pack on a downhill because the pack just can travel, especially a wide open downhill, much faster. Uh, th these guys are working so so strongly, especially Argentine, of course, who's sitting at the front, that he can keep the pace up, whereas the, the chase from the pack is more sporadic. It's up and down. You can see Steve Bauer now coming to the front, Janis Kuhn of Norway behind him. They very much want to catch the leaders, but they've simply waited too long. There you can see the cooperation, though, that is necessary if a successful chase is going to be made, that each rider must take his turn at the front of the field. None of the riders in this uh, in this picture right here, except uh, the one French team rider there, have anything to gain by staying back. They need to get a chase going. They need to form a partnership, uh, an alliance, if you will, an international alliance in order to get a chase going. They've got the strength in numbers. They just need to make a cooperative effort. Now they just made that downhill run, so they're pulling out quite far away from it because the pack is still on the hill, and these guys uh, don't have that much farther to go to the finish line. There's no catching these two riders. It's a question now of whether Charlie Morte is really fresh, whether he really has the sprint to beat Marina Argentina, or whether it's simply Marina Argentine day. He is looking fantastic at this point. He, he's not letting up. He's never wavered uh, since the breakaway went, and he's looking very strong. With a full lap to go, the gap between the, the, the leaders and this main group with a minute and a half is uh, still standing at around that point. I tend to agree with every revolution of those pedals, Connie and Bruce, that it, there's no catching those two leaders. I tend to agree. I'm not ready to give up yet. I'm not ready to give up the chances of everybody else in that field, Greg Lamont, Bernardino, and the rest. But with every stroke of those pedals, the chances get slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. Uh, Here comes that pack, or that hill that you were talking about earlier that you thought was really going to make the difference. Very short, steep hill. And uh, Mate in the tricolor on the right of our picture here. Argentine, the Italian with a uh, jerk of vertical stripes. Mote right now has the advantage. He's got. He's fresher. There's no question about it. He's fresher because he's been. But now Argentina is attacking. You see the teeth gritting expression on Mote. Mote is giving it everything he has. But Argentina, look, just effortlessly smooth riding up that hill, and he has got Charles Mote on the ropes right now. I think you were right, Brian. Argentina made the move on that on that little steep hill. And Charlie Morte tried to answer him, and you could see the look in his face. He's going after him now, but Marino Argentine is in total control of this race right now. It's, it's an unbelievable effort on his part. So cool, you so know, calm. So now he tried to get the lead before the downhill, so the other guy couldn't get in the draft. Exactly. Now Charlie Morte has to catch. It's a short downhill. They go into a turn. Difficult to chase at this point. And even if Morte does catch up, he's going to be very tired, probably more tired than Argentine, because Argentine just showed us how strong he is at this point. And we're really, we're within a mile of the finish and Argentina is simply magnificent at this point. The approach of Morte those is making up some ground right here. He had to push real hard on that downhill. He is in fact making up ground. He's got that slipstream to shoot into. He can move into that vacuum that's created behind the Moreno Argentine. So that helps him on the downhill. And now you see they have come back together and uh, Argentine looking back at Mote saying, okay, I've, I've, I've sent you a straight right to the jaw and you've managed to come back from that. Let's see what comes up next. But Argentine's also looking back to make sure that there isn't a rider coming up chasing him. He wants to make sure that 
it's his game now with Mote that he doesn't have to concern himself with the pack, who is, which is quite a bit behind him, rounding the last turn into the long finishing stretch. It's a curving finishing stretch. It's a one-on-one -on -one race right now. It's uh, it's head-to-head -head competition, the way we always like to see it. Moreno Argentine in the front, wearing the number 164. Charles Mote of France, number 105. Those are the two contenders for the World Championship of Professional Road Cycling, and they're in the last three or hundred yards of this race course right now. Well, it's a cat and mouse game now. Argentine's looking back. He knows now that he is the stronger rider. He just doesn't want to sprint too soon. He doesn't want to give too much too soon. He wants to be able to have enough to get across the finish line first. Argentine was third in the World Championships last year. He's 25 years old. He doesn't want to lose the sprint. You can see they're at 200 meters to go right now. Argentine's still playing with Mote. It's an uphill sprint, so it won't be as fast as some. Here they go. Here they go, Mote. mile race coming down to 200 yards. Mote trying to make a move off the back. Argentine seems to be in control. Argentine's Mote. well out in front of Mote at this point. Charlie Mote gives up, and Marino Argentine is the 1986 world champion. What a great tradition of uh, racing the Italians have had. Moreno Argentine continues that tradition. Here's the sprint for third, and oh, a very good finish for third place right there. And a very, very, there's all the riders rolling through. You can see each one reaching down, taking off his toe straps. 162 miles of racing is over. We're going to be right back to the World Championships of Professional Road Cycling right after these messages from our local stations. People are choosing Sprite. Italians getting first and third, the gold and the bronze medal here today, Connie. Sroni is, of course, the 1982 world champion. It's surprising he did so well today because he had a crash early on in the race. He got up, caught the group, and, uh, and won, this, won the sprint from the bunch. But it was Moreno Argentine's day all the way. He certainly seemed so calm and so cool and so collected and so professional and confident. He did a super job of... Uh, uh, he seemed to have all his abilities in hand. There he is... Uh, being interviewed and receiving the accolades, the beginnings of the accolades of the crowd. And here's our replay right here. There's Moreno Argentine. This, keep in mind, is the last three or 400 yards of the race as they approach the final corner at the bottom of an uphill section, a snaking, sort of winding uphill section through the feeds of the cabins, and there are the two leaders. Argentine was very confident at this. He had just made an attack. He knew Mote was weak. He knew he was strong. He knew that he he felt strong himself, I think. Argentine knew he was in control, I guess I should say. And uh, and really, Mote at this point is just hanging on, hoping that he'll have enough to get around Moreno, Argentine. But Argentine just waits and waits as they come through the long, windy section before the finish. 162 miles of racing comes down to two or 300 yards between two, two great professionals, two great athletes here. Moreno, Argentine in the front of these uh, of this pair of riders here. This is a replay of the finish. There's 200 meters to go, a little over 200 yards. And it looks a little slow right now. It's because they are going uphill, and they're not trying to sprint too early. Moreno, Argentine makes his move. Mote tries to come up and get around him, but there's no there's no going around Moreno, Argentine. He's just too fast. Mote tried and failed. Argentine is the world champion of professional road race cycling. We'll be right back after these local messages. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Just like Adriano De San, Italy's leading cycling commentator is welcoming the Italian public 
to the uh, 68th Giro d'Italia. My name is Jose Diaz from Italia Velo Sport, and I'd like to welcome you in the company of Brian Drever to the 68th Giro d'Italia. We're here to bring you the uh, comments on uh, what is the second biggest and most important stage race in the world. Hello, Brian. How are you doing, Jose? And I think one of the significant things about the Giro d'Italia in terms of uh, American fans is going to be that this, I believe, is the race where American professional riders really made their mark for the very first time uh, on, the, on the international cycling scene. By the way, Brian, this is a very unique uh, bicycle, as you can see. This was uh, a Bataillon bicycle that uh, Vicentini attempted to use at the uh, Prologue time trial. However, he was not allowed to uh, use it at the start. The uh, bicycle has a monocoque uh, construction in the uh, frame, and it was uh, some frame regulations as to pertains to what is allowed and what isn't that uh, inhibited the use of it. Since then, they've made some modifications to it, and at the Trofeo Baracchi, uh, the, uh, uh, I think that one of the Italian riders uh, used one, and uh, very successful, I might add. So Byzantini is now climbing on a more normal funny bike, as we might say, and, and uh, with the upturned bars, the disc wheels, and so on, even this bicycle, while it's uh, widely accepted now, would, would not have been allowed uh, as little as, uh, as uh, two years ago. Well, as you know, what, uh, what actually counts is uh, that you cannot add anything to the bicycle that in uh, so doing would make the bicycle more aerodynamic. So you cannot put covers on the wheels. However, you can put a wheel that the, the entirety of the wheel is, uh, is uh, a single unit, and that's uh, why disc wheels are allowed. Here we see the man that made this wheels famous, uh, Francesco Moser, in his uh, inimitable style of riding and uh, probably the, the best time trialist in the world right now without exception. He's a tremendous professional. I had the uh, pleasure of seeing him compete in Toronto in 1984 where he went uh, to compete in a, in, a, in, a, in a circuit event up there and was brought over. There's a tremendous Italian, in fact, probably the largest uh, Italian population outside of Italy is in Toronto, Canada, and the Italian fans turned out in droves to see Francesco Moser in 1984, and he gave them uh, their money's worth, even though none of them paid to see him. It, of course, many uh, bicycle races, most bicycle races here in this country, there's no admission. Uh, he was attacking consistently in the race. He was in every breakaway. He was uh, just a put on a tremendous performance uh, here in the United States in his only appearance uh, in North America. Well, I have the privilege of knowing him personally, and uh, he stayed at my house for a couple of weeks because in 1982 we brought him to one of our winter clinics. And when you say he's a professional, he is a professional in the full sense of the word. I think that this man could probably write the book on how to be a professional. Here we see him finishing, and uh, I believe uh, he's going to keep that uh, pink jersey, which is a leader's jersey. Uh, the reason why he started with it is because, uh, as we all know, he uh, won the 67th uh, Giro d'Italia last year. And uh, here we see that he did uh, win it. Uh, his uh, time was 45.06 for 6.6 uh, 6 kilometers. That was the uh, length of the prologue. And here he's going to make the people in the crowd pay the price of being close to greatness with the victory champagne being sprayed uh, and the pink jersey, the first of his Maglia Rosa jerseys for 1985, the 68th Giro d'Italia for Francesco Moser winning the prologue time trial. I'd like to interject the point. I don't know how many people are aware of uh, the significance of the uh, pink jersey. And that's the reason that it's pink is because the uh, newspaper that sponsors, uh, the main sponsor, I should say, of the uh, Giro, is called La Gazzetta dello Sport, and the papers, uh, the page upon which is printed is pink. So uh, it's exactly the same reason uh, for which the, uh, the uh, yellow jersey is uh, what's used in the uh, tour, because the uh, newspaper that sponsors uh, the tour, the uh, colors of the pages are actually yellow. Here we have uh, the, the actual first uh, road stage, which is... Um, um, stage one, the prologue is uh, basically done just to determine a, uh, a wearer of the uh, leader's jersey. But here we have stage one, and uh, we're looking at a small breakaway. Um, the last rider there, by the way, his name is Luciano Loro. He rides with El Tolnago. He uh, lives very close to where we have our training camps in the uh, summertime in Italy. 
and uh, he does talk quite frequently and uh, ride with uh, with some of the riders, so the best uh, riders that attend the Tavella Sport training camps. We saw Greg LeMond, the American, riding in his La Vie Claire colors, also in that uh, what was a four-man break and has now been joined by four more riders in totals eight in this first stage of the 68th Giro d'Italia. Well, Greg uh, is uh, riding the uh, Giro for the first time this year. He rode it for the first time this year. And uh, La Vie Claire had uh, one of the strongest, if not the strongest, team there. They uh, really left their mark on, uh, on the uh, Giro. No question about it. Now, competing in the Giro d'Italia for the first time uh, is, a, is an all-American trade team. And uh, that is the 7-Eleven team, or what we know as the 7-Eleven team here in the United States, with such familiar faces as Ron Kiefel and Davis Finney uh, forming the nest of that team. They are co-sponsored while they were in the Giro d'Italia by a, a vacuum cleaner manufacturer called Hunvit. So if you see close-ups of some of the 7-Eleven jerseys and you see a word on there you're not uh, familiar with, it is Hunvit, which is a vacuum cleaner manufacturer that co-sponsored the American 7-Eleven team in the Giro d'Italia. And they, as I said at the outset of this uh, videotape, uh, distinguish themselves, I think, a real turning point in cycling because it is not an individual leader, which we have had great individual performances in the past from Greg LeMond, from from uh, uh, other other Americans who have uh, distinguished themselves, Jacques Boyer, George Mount, but we have a whole team of American riders competing in the Giro d'Italia, a major European stage race for the very first time, and they showed very well for themselves. Well, here we have uh, what it actually you will see grows to be a typical image of uh, a Giro finish, and that's on the flat stages where we have is some of the best printing that you'll, you'll ever see. Uh, fortunately, there's going to be plenty of these, so uh, if there is any sprinters out there who are watching this thing, I uh, recommend that you watch real close because uh, you you can get a, a lesson in sprinting from the way these guys are going to go for the finish line. You're going to see some of the biggest field sprints you'll ever see. You're going to see definitely some of the fastest field sprints you'll ever see. And it's not for the faint of heart either. Is this field of riders is uh, well over 100 and a half riders. You can see what a tremendous group it is, and we're talking about 150 top European professional riders very closely matched in ability. We're talking about large teams of riders uh, that will be doing what they can to set their best sprint, and this is a wild and hairy affair as uh, this many guys comes to the finish line all in a group. Here's the first of what will be many tremendous field sprints in the Giro d'Italia. And here we got one of uh, several wins by Urs Freuler. Um, as uh, we know, Freuler has uh, already this year not only won several stages of the uh, Giro, which you will see later on, but uh, he also won the Kiering at the World Professional Championships as well as a points race. Urs Without a doubt, one of the uh, top sprinters in the world right now. Urs Freuler, very, very fine sprint, and that was eight, ten, twelve riders abreast on the road. Now here we are coming up on the second stage, which is a team time trial. And the entire team of riders, the trade team, will compete together. And the way that this is used in the results uh, for the overall prize in the Giro d'Italia for the overall results is that each rider will get the time of the team added to his individual general classification. And if any rider is off the back of the team time trial, he will leave his own individual time. Here is the Del Tongo Clonago team, led, of course, by uh, Giuseppe Cerrone, a former winner of the uh, Giro d'Italia. Actually, Cerrone has won it twice, uh, Brian. And here we have a very well-known sponsor to us, Coca-Cola. Uh, even though here in the United States they haven't been doing much uh, cycling sponsorship, as you can see in Europe, uh, they've uh, taken cycling in a very serious way. So off goes the uh, Del Tongo Colnago squad, and they will quickly form uh, form into a pace line. They will work together just as if they were in a breakaway. They will be trying to uh, post as good a time as they possibly can. And what it means for the team is, of course, in the team classification, uh, This can, it's very obvious how this would count in team classification. And for individual classification, if they are looking to put their team leader in contention in the individual classification as much time as they can gain on their rivals team captain uh, in this team time trial will go will count very 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 strongly this is very popular not only for the teams but for the uh, fans and for the spectators 
who are able to watch them compete as a unit and they are very significant in the in terms of the overall results the, the team time trials that we that we see in the Giro d'Italia the Tour de France and many of the uh, international stage races now the the speed that they sustain in these uh, events is uh, utterly incredible uh, Actually, this team time trial is going to have a uh, winning uh, speed of average speed of approximately 33, 34 miles an hour. It is not a short event. This one in particular, I believe, was uh, a distance of about 50, 60 kilometers. So uh, it's not something that it's, uh, it's a tiny little event like the prologue, which we were talking about six kilometers, 650 meters. Here we're talking about a fairly lengthy uh, event. And... Uh, we're going to see some very, very, very fast uh, speeds. You can see the, the pace line, or, or more or less a mini echelon, that the riders have formed here, and they'll, they'll uh, go through the corner in formation. Here is yet another team, and this is Moser's team, and you can see him wearing number one, and also wearing the pink jersey uh, that he has earned by virtue of a victory in the prologue time trial and holds through the finish of stage one, which was a bunch sprint, and his entire team here now, uh, Moser riding uh, right in the middle of that bunch. Now, uh, the teams really don't practice uh, this kind of event uh, very much, but these guys being professionals and riding, all of them riding well over 100 races every year and training thousands and thousands of miles, whereas uh, whether in group or individually, they're, they're bike handling technique and their uh, sense of, uh, of a pace line and their sense of, uh, of sitting on a wheel is so uh, magnificent that uh, it's almost second nature for them to, uh, to ride this in, in almost perfect harmony. There's uh, Moser at the tail end having just taken his turn at the front. You'll see each rider in turn will slip off to the side, the downwind side of the, uh, of the pace line. If there's any crosswind whatsoever, if they have to choose between going uh, left or right, They'll choose the downwind side to move to the rear, and uh, the side that is uh, that is in the wind will be the forward or advancing side of this little mini echelon here. Here we get a shot of one of the camera bikes, the cameramen taking pictures of each other there apparently, and Moser squad going down the road. Now here we have the arrival of the uh, Del Tongo team, and uh, they're the actual uh, race terminated inside a, uh, a uh, track in Milano. This is, uh, by the way, this is the famed Vigorelli in Milano. The Vigorelli Velodrome providing the finish for the this team time trial. A number of the stages in, in, in stage races do finish on the velodromes of Europe. They'll, they'll bring them in. They'll uh, permits them to gather a, a gate to have spectators pay to sit in the grandstand, and they'll have what amounts to an exhibition finish inside of a velodrome, and that's what we're seeing here. The uh, Del Tongo squad finishing, finishing there. There we see their time and the running time of the team currently on the track. And uh, it's slower. So at this point, we actually have the Del Tongo team ahead. Good aerial shot of the velodrome and a large crowd on hand. That's uh, Mosar's team. Finishing second. Finishing second, correct. And having lost 11 seconds as a unit to the members of the Del Tongo squad that has already finished. Which actually, in, uh, by so doing, it actually gives the uh, pink jersey to Cerrone. So each individual on Cerrone's team will have lost 11 seconds to each individual on the Del Tongo squad. So in terms of individual general classification, you'll see that, that you would see that all of the, uh, the team members of a particular team will be awarded the team time. There we see Cerrone uh, being interviewed with the new pink jersey that he has just earned, or that his team has just earned for him. Cerrone, by the way, is uh, the second most popular rider in, uh, in Italy, second only to Moser. And uh, he's just explaining how, how important it was for them to uh, win this, because uh, in so doing, without uh, an incredible effort, they could actually pick up the uh, pink jersey, which is uh, quite valuable, not, not only in terms of uh, of personal gratification, but in terms of publicity, and uh, that's exactly what the sponsors are paying for. A little trivia for fans that don't know that uh, when Gibby Hatton became the first American rider to win an international world championship in the modern era, so to speak, back in 1974, as a junior, the rider that he defeated for that uh, junior world sprint championship was uh, 
was Giuseppe Cerrone. And here they are a dozen years later. Cerrone is, a, is an international hero and, and uh, revered in his own country. Uh, Gibby Hatton similarly uh, famous here in the United States and both still competing, although uh, Hatton is a track specialist and Cerrone has made the transition to the, to the road. So this is stage number three. It's 190 kilometers and it goes from the Sea of Milano to uh, Pinzolo. We uh, actually have a stage here that is uh, not flat. At the beginning of it is rather flat, but uh, towards the end we, we have two uh, mountain creams and it actually fin uh, finishes at a uh, slight uphill. Not, not a great uphill, but a slight uphill. There we see one of the red, white, and green jerseys uh, of the American 7-Eleven team, and it's Andy Hampston wearing the number 64. There's the Hoonved on the side, and uh, this is Andy Hampston who rides in the United States for Raleigh, is competing on the 7-Eleven trade team, the Giro d'Italia, and he is on a solo breakaway at this point in, the, in this third stage. It's uh, kind of a prediction of things to come. The American riders doing quite well. Hampson, in fact, earning a stage victory in uh, the Giro d'Italia, a real landmark for American racing uh, cyclists, American racing pros. They certainly gained the respect of the European uh, riders and the European press. At first, in the first few stages, they were accused of some uh, somewhat dangerous uh, sprinting, etc. But uh, later on, with, uh, with the results and uh, with their seriousness and dedication, they actually gain uh, an incredible amount of respect, at least from the Italian uh, cycling world and the uh, Italian press. Hampton followed uh, his success in the Giro d'Italia, a very fine uh, runner-up. He, he was runner-up in the course classic in the United States to Greg LeMond. LeMond winning first place, Andy Hampton really giving LeMond the only challenge that he received during the entire uh, national tour of America. Uh, here they are racing against each other in Europe. Now here we have uh, one of those uh, crashes which... Uh, Unfortunately, um, occur every so often uh, in Italy, in particular, they've uh, claimed that uh, some of these crashes uh, have been attributed to uh, the uh, helicopter. They, the riders have uh, protested uh, vehemently about the uh, helicopter sometimes getting too close, and with the turbulence, the air turbulence created by the uh, rotor blades, uh, creating a little bit of havoc in the group. And if, as you all know, if it doesn't touch, uh, just hit wheels and uh, before you know it uh, 20 30 guys can go down if you have a big enough group it's amazing that there aren't worse situations that are caused by a tremendous rolling caravan that takes place in one of these uh, large stage races there in the foreground is ron kiefel making repairs to his equipment and a fallen rider there in the middle of the street is being attended to by one of the motorcycle drivers there are so many vehicles in these races that um, it's really a tribute to the skill of the drivers the cyclists and everyone concerned that more serious accidents do not happen. Somebody is in definite serious chase mode here, Jose, because that single file shot there tells us that, uh, that up front, a very, very definite effort being made. Here's Hampton just now caught. Well, earlier we looked at, uh, I think that Cerrone had put pretty much his team up front. Uh, there was a, a shot earlier where you had most of the uh, Del Tongo, all the yellow jerseys from the Del Tongo up front. And he had to do that because at uh, this point in time, with only a 10-second lead, uh, he, he had to do that. You have to get your team out there to work for you. Here we see evidence of, of the handiwork of Italian fans in the street again as they as they uh, paint up the names of some of their favorite riders or whatever and onto the street and as large as those letters were they had to be uh, gearing that towards the helicopter shots or somebody uh, quite quite far away here we have uh, baron kelly which is uh, one of uh, italy's uh, well-known and famous riders and here's a young man that uh, on his first year as a pro he uh, ended up getting second place at the giro which uh, shot him to instant stardom. And unfortunately, he, he's been one of these riders that everybody has expected since then, have expe has expected so much of him, and has not been able to deliver. You know, he's, he's won many races, but everybody was expecting uh, the next Kopi. It seems whenever any rider comes along with any skill or any, any promising characteristics, uh, the Italian press and the Italian public is looking at the next Kopi. And, uh, you know, Kopi, like Merckx, uh, there's only one of them, you know. I think that uh, in uh, 
in Belgium, they suffer from the same malady. Every time a new rider comes along that uh, shows any promise, they immediately say, well, here's another Merckx. You know, I think that's happened with Van der Art. And uh, it happened with the Wolf, yeah. And, uh, it's, it's, there's Merckx, there's only one. Uh, Kopi, there's only one. Uh, and it's pretty hard for a rider to then carry that uh, on his shoulders. I suppose here in the United States, uh, fans would be looking for the next Greg LeMond and the current Greg LeMond is only 24 years old and right uh, at, at, just at the threshold of a great great career and uh, he's really made a mark in international cycling already made his mark here in the United States a long time ago as a junior and has uh, raced virtually his entire career since uh, graduating from the junior ranks as a European professional the expectations that people had of him have been realized in every way yeah, but some of these riders, the pressure is too much. Here we got, they're setting up for the sprint, and uh, as you can see, it's at this point, they're going probably around 35, 36 miles an hour. And from that speed, then they're going to progress up to actually a full sprint. It's, uh, that's typical of the, of the Italian uh, Giro semi-flat stages, where you have very slow start, and then at the end, you have incredible speeds, like the last hour is usually somewhere between 50 and 60 kilometers an hour. Here, a rider has made a very definite commitment, and there we see that familiar blue uh, jersey of Fruller and a crash as one of the riders, for whatever reason, was forced into or went into the feet of those little barricades. And uh, sprinting up front here, we have uh, Cerrone, not content to sit on that pink jersey, is going to take a statement uh, to boot. And there he is. He's going to stand on the awards platform, not only as the wearer of the pink jersey, but as the stage winner. Here is a re replay now of the crash. And as you can see, one of the riders uh, on the far left of the screen, the far right of the road, was uh, took a wide line there and was put, in, was put into the barricades, either through his own efforts or uh, having been forced over there by one of the other riders. Well, that was, that was, uh, he, he flew. I mean, no question about it. That guy just was going, at the speed at which he was going, I mean, it's it's amazing that he's alive. To be honest with you. And now they're dragging in the, just at the top of the screen, you could see the... By the way, we see Davis Finney. Uh, I don't know if you noticed it, but he was right at the top of the screen there. And getting one of the top ten finishes. And there he is now wearing the wearing the uh, the purple or maroon jersey of the points leader. Apparently, consistency in stage finishes at this point has earned him the right to wear that point leader jersey. We've seen him in a similar jersey in uh, the Coors Classic in Colorado as the leader. And here, Davis Finney, America, certainly America's premier uh, finisher, uh, ra race finisher, is uh, earning a similar honor in Europe. Now, we're going to the mountains, and this is stage four. It's 237 kilometers, and it goes from Pinzolo to Selva de Valgardena. Selva de Valgardena is a ski resort. And uh, actually, this stage, not only is it uh, quite long, but it finishes on the top of the climb. It has two uh, mountain creams, and uh, one of them, as a matter of fact, is the, uh, is the finish line, which is good for mountain classification points. And here we have a pretty significant situation with one of the riders. Uh, his equipment has very definitely let him down at that point as he reaches for a shift. Uh, the bicycle does not respond, and this is uh, a pretty sad situation for a rider. On a steep climb as he is in right now, the rest of the field just simply going past him as he is helpless to, to do anything. Now we're looking at Baron Kelly again, uh, whom uh, we were talking about earlier as uh, one of those uh, riders that was expected to be the next Kopi. He's a very good climber, which is surprisingly, because uh, I know uh, Baron Kelly personally, and he's about 6'1", 6'2", which is uh, rather tall for somebody to be as good a climber. We have Vicentini there from uh, the Carrera Inox Grand team, another good uh, Italian climber. And uh, Van der Belde is uh, wearing the purple jersey. Here we have uh, Hino. And we see Moser uh, following that uh, small breakaway. There's uh, Lejareta, and he's an outstanding climbing rider. And um, he's churning along there in the small chain ring, probably a 42 team that gives you an idea of how steep a climb this really is, going up to uh, Val Gardena, the ski resort. There's Eno, tremendous uh, all-around 
rider. His all-round abilities are what have come to uh, five consecutive Tour de France, or five vi Tour de France victories, not consecutive, but in anybody's lifetime, that is certainly an accomplishment. Only three riders in the world have done that. Well, there's no question that they're climbing here, Brian. It's uh, and uh, these are roads that are typical to Italy. That's uh, that's one of the reasons why I think that uh, you have such good riders over there because you have uh, so many roads that uh, you ride on them and you say, my God, nobody who was a rider actually was a guy who designed this road because they're almost perfect roads for the for the purpose of riding a bicycle. Large lumber mill on the rear, and here's uh, Eno leading a small group in uh, pursuit of La Jareta. In the fourth stage of 1985 Giro d'Italia. That area over there, by the way, it's uh, it's in the Dolomites, and uh, it's probably one of the most beautiful sections of Italy. Where at this point we're not too far from uh, the area where all the skiing takes place. Um, I think that uh, we're near the border with uh, Austria, and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful area, not just. Uh, for skiing, but in the uh, summertime is where a lot of Italians come for holidays because of the altitude and the uh, cool weather. Appears to be a, a bit of uh, moisture in the air, either low-hanging clouds or actual rain. And uh, those are obviously wet and occasionally you see drops on the camera lens. As uh, you know there, the famous Bernardino of the La Vie Claire team climbing in between uh, two other riders. The road is apparently flattened out a bit here as we see the riders now in a large chain ring and, and uh, picking up speed. Leading the group right now, we have Roberto Vicentini, and Vicentini is uh, actually, as it's going to turn out, he's going to uh, be wearing the pink jersey for quite a few stages. Then he came down with intestinal flu and, uh, and uh, actually ended up not, uh, I don't think he even finished the Giro. He's a very, very strong Italian rider. Again, everybody's putting so much uh, expectations on him, and uh, he kind of tends to choke at the, at the crucial point. There you get an idea of just how the lead they have at this point. Certainly enough to uh, destroy the 10-second advantage in general classification that Cerrone holds, and uh, that, is, that is very obviously uppermost on the mind of the little group, that's in, and also very prominent in figuring in what's going on here in this chase group. At this point, and uh, Ronnie was a minute and a half behind Brian. And he was probably in that group that they're showing now. There, in there fact, he is. He yeah. is in the third, third position. In the front, in the pink yeah. jersey. And he's got two of his teammates in front, uh, Del Tongo and Colnago teams. He's trying to minimize his losses at this time, but he has, in fact, lost the pink jersey on the road and at the finish of the race. Uh, you say that uh, Byzantini takes the, takes the Maglia Rose of the pink jersey and will wear it for some time to come. Right, because I think that uh, the Carrera Inox Brand team was third in the team time trial, and Vicentini is a very good time trial. I don't think he had lost very much in the prologue. So he's, uh, I think it's at this stage that he dons the uh, pink jersey. We come to the final kilometer of this of the fourth stage, with this uh, little group of five riders climbing quite well through the crowd, pressing in around them. It's amazing that uh, the spectators have so little room in between each other to, uh, to commit the riders here. And he knows leading it at this point. And with his sprinting ability, will uh, very nearly gone for the victory. And Sates, yeah. Sates won it from the Chilo Alfina team. Here's the replay. You can see this is textbook uh, how to win from behind. You take a shot, accelerate at the guy in his slipstream. You know, looks quickly over his shoulder and sees the, the sees Sates already moving faster than he having accelerated into that drift and uh, slingshotting around. Here comes uh, Cerrone in to finish with his two teammates. And he's finishing 139, 139 behind. So here we see Sace, which is the uh, stage winner, and then Vicentini, which uh, at this point uh, picked up the pink jersey. And the white and green jerseys? The white jersey is the uh, Neo Pro, the best Neo Pro jersey. And then the green is the, uh, the uh, uh, points. Here we're from Selva di Bargardena to Vittorio Veneto. And this is 226 kilometers and it's the fifth stage uh, of the Giro.
in the rain. In the rain, no less. So this one would start at high altitude and uh, begin with a descent. This begins with a very steep descent. Then they have a gradual climb to two uh, mountain creams, and then it's uh, somewhat of a descent all the way down to Vittorio Veneto. And with the with the rain, the wet roads, this uh, this descent would uh, have its elements of danger. No question about it. Nobody making any serious movement at this point early in, and that because of the length of the races and the way these things sort of develop, that usually early on the race the race is as much a parade as anything else. That they'll just simply everyone declare ruse up to a certain point at, at, at which the racing really begins. And uh, of course, there are exceptions to that, and occasionally you read about, hear about, or witness. Uh, the odd breakaway from the gun, the, the, the uh, desperate uh, effort by some by rider, a rider, or groups of riders, to wait for 200 kilometers or more only to be caught near the finish. Right, that happens a lot. You you and have riders that have gained up to 20, 26 minutes and have been wearing the pink jersey. But uh, when the group really decides to react, uh, they they pick up the speed to such incredible levels here in the last uh, kilometers when we're talking about uh, the last maybe 50, 60 kilometers, and they can uh, totally obliterate somebody's lead in, in a very short period of time because the speeds at which they, they get going uh, during that last hour, hour and a half are incredible. There's Moser, number one, no longer wearing the pink jersey, but nevertheless the defending uh, champion of the Giro d'Italia. That's a very unique jersey, by Brian. I don't know if you notice it, but it's got a huge ice cream cone in the back. The Gis team. He's uh, the most first team. It's, it's a humongous ice cream cone right on the back of the jersey. And he's got his troops up front right now. Very fast pace at this point. Looks back. And this is a very interesting shot here as the helicopter goes into the clouds, showing us the conditions, really, that the riders are racing under it. Apparently, it's not particularly cold, but it certainly is wet. This is the entrance into the city of Vittorio Veneto, which is a very old, very uh, pretty city. It's quite old, and uh, it's nestled right in the, in the valley. Uh, it is not too far from uh, where we do a lot of our training rides, so every once in a while we do have a ride going into this uh, section here. And on this descent, this is, uh, this is where the, the riders who have the skill, the bike handling skills, are really going to have to uh, show their stuff. And it's uh, quite, whoa, and this is Moser now, down, as you can see, and uh, harmlessly enough, sliding along on the pavement because it is so wet that caused him to lose control of his bike and uh, then worked in his favor once he was actually on the deck and see, see him actually sliding along with the bicycle bouncing beside him. He comes to a rest very quickly and harmlessly enough uh, picks his bike up and, and will get right back into the race. Even the, even the best guys fall down every now and then. Yeah, we're looking at the last kilometer coming into uh, the city. As you can see, it's a very old city, narrow streets, uh, old castles right in the middle of town, etc. It's very picturesque. And as poor as the weather conditions are, and the race finishing practically in the dark, there are still plenty of uh, Italian fans to, to come and enjoy. This is another good sprint here, good in that the racers are competing very determinedly, but uh, one rider there feeling as though he was wrong, raising his hand, and I think correctly so, having been forced pretty well from one side of the road to the other by the apparent winner of the stage. Yeah, correctly so is right, and uh, as it turned out, the um, the rider that... Uh, that uh, right there, he switched very, very hard from one side of the road to the other. This is the kind of thing that the commissaires will look at. Did the rider in the front prevent the rider from a fair opportunity to win the race? And I think in everyone's mind looking at this, the answer would have to be yes, that uh, the Del Tongo rider in the yellow jersey was not given a fair opportunity to uh, to win the race by the, the good rider who crossed the line first. Well, the Del Tongo rider was awarded the stage, um, and uh, there was a bit of controversy. This is Silva, the, in the green and red, that was the apparent winner of the stage, and he was the runner-up in the final stage of the Tour of America here in the United States uh, in a great, great sprint finish with two echelons of riders down the road, uh, Ron Heyman on the left, the event, the, the ultimate winner, and Da Silva on the far right side of the road, both thinking they had won the race and probably 
100 feet of, uh, of distance from left to right between them. Now we're looking at stage number six, 232 kilometers, and they're going from Vitoria Veneto to Serbia. As you can see, the weather has changed considerably. And uh, we're now enjoying some of the Italian uh, sunny work. Here we have Bombini, and this is the guy who was awarded the stage uh, the previous day. Here we have Cerrone. And Dongo's strat at this point is to uh, pick up the key pass. There's slips quickly of uh, Greg right. the American. And the teeny in the pink. Greg wearing helmet. Some of the riders do choose, for one, uh, one reason or another, to wear helmets, even though they're not required. Uh, it's interesting to look in magazines and to see coverage of races in Europe. It's very easy to, to see which races are in Belgium, because in Belgium they are required, the professionals are required to wear a helmet, and in none of the other countries are they required to, although some riders uh, choose, to, choose to do so nevertheless. Well, in the Giro, there's a lot of riders that uh, will wear a helmet, but only during the last uh, 50, 60 kilometers. If they're going to uh, uh, attempt to participate in the sprint, uh, there are some riders that are actually just then uh, pull it out of their back pockets and uh, put it on and uh, participate in the sprint. And here, apparently, a couple of riders touching wheels and going down and uh, now getting back up and into the race once again. The, the shot just previous showing the huge herd of riders going down the road. It's, it's no wonder that situations like this develop from time to time. Even among the best and most experienced professionals, it doesn't take much when you're traveling inches apart at 30 to 35 miles an hour to uh, cause a chain reaction crash. This is a stage, by the way, it's as flat as uh, flat can be. So you're going to have uh, probably another one of those uh, humongous field sprints. And again, it bears a lot of really close observation for riders aspiring to be field sprint winners. Obviously, many riders attempt to not have a race get down situation where they have to get into a field sprint. They'll try to break away and win alone or get themselves an advantage in some way where their their race might be against a small number of riders but every in every rider's career and every racer's career it comes to a point when you've got to make your best effort in a big mass field sprint and watching these stage finishes in Italia is as good an opportunity as you'll ever get to see how large sprint develops not only for the individuals but how the team set, set up for the sprint and we're in the last kilometer now and we have a, a rider that has actually broken away from the group. Making a, a different bid for victory here. Taking a lull that usually precedes a stage finish, but apparently uh, he will be, he has been caught. We saw him just, just drifting off to the right side of that group. As here comes a wild finish again. I think we've got Cerrone there on the left. And Fruller in the middle. There's Fruller in the blue jersey in there, but I think Cerrone taking that. Very fine. And then at the back of the bunch, of course, when there are no bonuses for the top spots, or there are no bonuses, there are only time bonuses for the top finishers. And once it is obvious that you will finish in the group, you just roll across the line and get the same time as the rest of the field. Places are insignificant stage race beyond the first half or so. Now, I, I mistakenly glad Ryder Cerrone on the right. That's Frank Holt, the, um, the rider that's uh, with a yellow jersey on the right side of the road there, which I believe is the guy that wins the stage. I believe it's Ruler in the middle, Lou. And, and Rosola on the left, yeah. So three of the best sprinters in European professional racing for obviously realizing 30 or 40 meters before the line that he cannot win, just coasts across for third. Okay, now we're moving on to the seventh stage, which is from Serbia to Jezi, and uh, we're looking at a 105-kilometer stage. At this point, it's about 50 kilometers to the finish, and this uh, group here has about five and a half minutes. Good sized group of riders. And we have the pink jersey in there as well. This is Byzantini in the, in the main butt. Uh, Ahead of them, a small group that has five minutes. Right. When you have a group at 50 kilometers, to the finish, apparently there's nobody in danger, man, in there because other than we live in more than. So the leaders, the contenders at this point, having looked around and satisfied themselves that uh, they are all in this in this large group, are are unconcerned about the break group out in front. Correct. 
At this point, they just show us the general class. We have Vicentini, which is wearing jersey, and uh, second to him is uh, Bernard Hinault, sitting at uh, comfortable 20 seconds behind them. And this is the members of the breakaway group, none of whom were listed at DC standings uh, in the previous graphic. Now we're almost at the finish, and we have two of them that have uh, separated themselves at the front there we're under the one kilometer banner. So two of six riders have now gained a advantage, but the other four seem to be to reel that in. A lot of pride going into you know, an opportunity for perhaps riders who are not contenders in general classification, and in fact, lieutenants on some of the seconds, if you will, to the to the team leaders. They have their opportunity to stand in the sun with a stage with a stage victory, and often the motion comes perhaps from it being your own hometown or near your own hometown. Well, to any professional rider to win a uh, stage of the Giro, the Tour is uh, is actually money in the bank. Uh, number one, because uh, after the Giro and the Tour comes a sea of, uh, of uh, criteriums, and these are by invitation. And uh, you're actually given start money. And uh, most of the guys that get invited to these uh, criteriums are riders who have won stage. So, in effect, what you're talking about, winning a stage to a rider, there is a, a significant uh, increase in his uh, potential to make money out of the sport. Here, the Del Tongo team leads the group in, a minute and 40 seconds at this point behind the lead group and another great field sprint coming up for what for is what is seventh place in the stage look at this it's great and as you saw earlier brian and you pointed out very well it was the total team that was uh, setting the pace line there and the reason why they were setting the pace line is because they had their man Cerrone sitting about in third or fourth to sit so what they would do at this point is they would each just take a pull until they can't go any further and then swing over and then the next Del Tongo guy takes a pull and then the next Del Tongo guy and they'll usually have somebody sitting right behind Cerrone which means when Cerrone is ready to then do his uh, sprint the guy right behind him just slows down and lets the gap open up. Here's a replay of the, the sprint of leaders. See that the rears are pushing tremendous gears to the finish and this after 185 kilometers of racing or uh, near, well over 100 miles in their legs at this point. Okay, we're going on to the eighth stage point, and uh, we're going from Foggia to Materas. At this uh, junior here, Giro has been progressively moving south since it started in Verona, which is uh, fairly to the north of, uh, of Italy, and then it went north a little bit, turned around, and started moving south. And uh, at this point, we're about halfway down uh, the uh, country, moving along the uh, easternmost side. One of the tremendous great starts of Giro d'Italia, and likewise the Tour de France, these riders, nearly 200 in number, begin by parading out of it, and all of the whole virtual town turns out and see them lining the streets, and off the riders go into, uh, into the countryside to, to another town where they'll stop for the night and take it up again the next day. And the pace early on here is quite uh, quite fast. They have, well, this is the finish. No, no, this, uh, it was a rather uneventful stage, and uh, what they were showing was I was, uh, yeah. And here's the replay of the sprint then. And it, in the blue and white in the center is Fuller. To his right, our left is uh, Silva, and these are the, these are the guys that, when they get close to the finish line, are going to the front and make the sprint. You can see the tremendous effort that he makes, and uh, even a second effort that comes up just short as the Silva is able to get his front wheel across the line. It's ahead of Fuller, who throws his bike with a tremendous arm extension in an effort to win. It's actually a good shot of throwing your bike, you know, and I see uh, the effort that Fur is doing uh, at that point is to throw that wheel forward. And a real, real good frame shot there, only two guys, and here's apparently a very large mishap in the middle of a wheat field or something resembling a wheat field, and riders trooping through the through the grass to get around the fallen ones who are in the row. Fall confusion here is the mechanics and uh, team manager, support personnel, and motorcycle riders and everybody attempt to get underway and the racers themselves going well off into the weeds here in an effort to get themselves back onto the road and, and engine back let, into contention. Let me explain for a minute, Ryan, what, what occurred here is that in Foggia, where the, where the race started, they had 45 kilometer uh, criterion, and that's what we saw the finish of. Uh, characteristically, this 45 kilometer criterion had an speed of 48 kilometers an hour, which was uh, approximately 30 miles an hour. 
Then afterwards, I was in the morning, and then about uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, they left on uh, this 167-kilometer uh, road stage, point-to-point -point stage. What we're looking at now, and that uh, crash that we saw was uh, part of the road uh, section of the day. Now, this is Bob Roll from California, who is one of the American professionals competing in the Giro d'Italia on the in the colors of the 7-Eleven racing team and Bob Roll distinguished himself following the Giro d'Italia with a stage win in, in the Giro America, if you will, the course classic in the United States and here he's uh, showing himself quite well with a solo effort. He's grandstanding at this point or hoping that he'll get some in the form of other riders to come up and join him and get a breakaway going and then quickly once again to the finish a rider who's apparently away in who also get swallowed up as he sits up in despair on the left side of the screen there and the entire peloton is dashing past him to the finish what we're looking at actually is a mistake uh, it's uh, it's one uh, one circuit uh, around the uh, finish it's supposed to go one loop around before the actual finish so that guy was uh, under the mistaken impression which again by what was the uh, the Italian telling the, the commenter was very difficult. Now I believe that we have the actual sprint here. And this looks a little bit more like a sprint with only one or four. And here we have let's just get the line. And, and that was Da Silva who won that uh, that sprint, by the way. Again, Da Silva, one of the premier field sprinters, just as Davis Finney here in the United States. Davis Finney is in this race and will show himself well, but by his own admission, he's just short of these seasoned European professionals have in terms of being able to finish at the end of load races. I think that uh, in talking to uh, Finney, uh, he was interviewed in Italy, and uh, he mentioned that what he's lacking is that progression or that acceleration that a lot of these guys have, and, uh, where they can actually start the sprint at uh, 30 plus miles an hour and then progress it or accelerate up to uh, in the in the 40 or the low 30. And he, he lacks constant acceleration because if you see a lot of these guys when they finish, when they go across the finish line, they're still accelerating. And uh, by his own admission, Davis says that he actually slows down. There you see incredible bike handling, by the way, where two uh, riders, one of them, Van der Bell, with the uh, purple jersey, almost collided with the ride. Right behind the leading on each other was, in fact, the, the rider of, we, of whom we were just speaking. Here is Da Silva wearing the green points or sprint leaders. You're about to demonstrate his ability to uncork a champagne, a magnum of champagne on the crowd. Okay, we move on to the ninth stage, which is Mat Crotone. We're looking at 237, yeah, 37 kilometers. And this stage uh, is as flat as they come, 237, totally flat. Vicentini is still wearing the uh, pink jersey, with he knows sitting in uh, second position at uh, 28 seconds. 28 seconds. Right. And Lamont sitting down seventh position at just over two minutes. This is the ninth stage of the Giro Here we're looking at them 15 kilometers from the finish. And altogether, predict after a flat stage, even this some 140 miles or more in length. Totally flat, and uh, we have a compact group. The Colombians, by the way, uh, had a team uh, in this Giro, but it seems like it was almost too flat for them in uh, stages. They were well and uh, started going up, but uh, they would take a, a beating on these uh, stages because uh, they, they just don't have uh, the uh, 35, 40 miles an hour on their legs, and uh, they just uh, sometimes they would actually get dropped on some of these flat portions. Or else uh, they might get uh, dropped in the flash and get up to a hill, then work their buns off to uh, get to the top of the hill with the leaders, and then to lose it in the, in the next flash. And the Colombians uh, traditionally have had some difficulty in Europe, particularly on the flats. They have no problems with the hills. They're used to worse hills than, uh, than anything that they, they just have difficulty with the spin flats. By contrast, the Dutch riders, who have absolutely no mountain hills to climb well, are able to train themselves to climb well because it takes very much of the same ability to be able 35 miles an hour on the flats. If you're small and light, the same kind of power can be applied in a lower gear uphill. The Colombians just don't have any flat places to train on, and they therefore have not developed the horsepower. It's just 
a question of horsepower. Many of the Colombian riders are very, very small, very slightly built, and just don't have the raw power it takes to go fast on flat ground. Here we have uh, the rider sent. It's got another wild one here. It's all the walling into a, almost a hair turn to the finish. And Edlin the caravan comes to the finish line after nearly six hours running time at 5.48 and a half. And here's and Bontempi second. By the way, we're from the same town. Rosola rides for, and Bontempi rides for Carrera Inuxpran, and train together all night. And uh, they're both incredible sprinters. They're about the same height. They're about the same weight. They're the very large uh, for riders. They're not climbers, either one of them, yet uh, they're excellent, excellent, excellent sprinters. And... A happy young man, obviously. He won away. That was a quite a significant margin of victory there. And Vizantini again with the pink jersey as the overall leader. It's obvious why the terrain is flat there at the ocean. Now we're in Calabria, which is we're hitting the, the southernmost portion of Italy. And uh, we're going to cross now. We're actually going from the east coast of Italy to the west coast of Italy. So you're going to see uh, some serious climbing here. Solo breakaway at this point, or a solo effort at this point. One rider having extracted himself from the wedge shape of the field here. As they will head towards some climbing portions of the course and are now beginning to get into what amounts to the foothills of a major climb. There you can see the La Vie Claire jerseys and Greg Lamont sitting in second position there in the, in the field chasing. At that La Herreta had Simpson up ahead and uh, to set the pace in the climb, which is something that climbers do quite frequently. They send uh, one of their teammates ahead of the road so that everybody does the chasing. They just sit back there. And when they catch up with the uh, teammate that they send up the road, then they set up their own act. You see now the group is beginning to break losing off the back. We would expect the Dislids and Froilers and uh, Sprinters, the guys who are there at the finish of the flat stage, would be the ones that are drifting off the back here. Comes uh, Moser, I believe, at the front. No, that's Chiocioli. It's, uh, it's a young man, and this one, his physiognomy is even similar to Kopi's. So here there's another one of those... Uh, Let's have another Kopi uh, type kind of rush. Long and thin legs. Beautiful countryside. There is Vicentini with the pink jersey. At this point, uh, the uh, Italian commentator is, uh, is talking about the fact that Cerrone is nowhere to be seen. Oh, here we see him now. So he's he's lost quite a bit of touch is uh, something that is going to put him this stage I believe puts their own contention of the uh, leadership uh, or anywhere near the leadership of the Giro. I saw Cerrone in time winner of the Giro d'Italia. It's not to be his year in, eight, in 1985. It's actually amazing that uh, Cerrone could win a race the Giro with as many as they usually have in it because he, he doesn't have a climber's body. Uh, Cerrone is a typical sir body. He's, he's short, he's stocky. And uh, how he can uh, keep with these guys climbing, which uh, there's a lot of specialists here, a lot of climbing specialists, and how he can keep up with these guys is quite interesting. In, uh, in order to win the Giro, you, you have to climb well, just trust yourself in the climbs. You have, to, you have to climb well. There was, again, one of the red and green 7-Eleven USA jerseys going, going through there, and behind Moser, who also didn't look like he was in great point either. He looked like he was suffering a bit on the climb himself, the defending, the defending champion of the world. It's another guy who's actually uh, made himself into a climber in the last couple of years. He has done a, a lot of, uh, of uh, Eric Threshold work, and uh, his uh, training for the hour record has really turned them around. Since uh, that point, not only has he won the Giro, but he's become the premier time trialist in the world. And he's actually developed into a halfway decent climber in, uh, in an international scale. We caught a glimpse briefly of them going by in that group right there, wearing number 87. And uh, there's De Silva in the green points jersey. 
And here comes the sprint. The green points jersey very prominent at the front, as you might expect. De Silva has gotten himself in a position to be near the finish and produces yet another stage win to add to his to his points for stage finishes. Da Silva, by the way, Brian, is uh, Portuguese, and uh, he was a pupil of uh, Agostino. Agostino was a uh, famous Portuguese writer, probably the oldest writer at the time that he died last year in an incident in a sprint uh, where a dog came out on the road and uh, he actually went over the handlebars and uh, apparently hit his head uh, the next day he, uh, he was drinking. And so, too, is the 10th stage 1985 Giro d'Italia history. With us uh, enjoy the, the victory and Vincentini plants again the pinky as, as the overall leader. And here we start the uh, 11 lap, and this one is Paola Turno. I guess we're somewhere close, and uh, we're looking at somebody here watching some snails. Uh, some good seafood restaurant is somewhere around the corner here. Fans are rocking themselves until the arrival of the Peloton, and here it approaches now with 33 kilometers to the finish, and uh, a single file line apparently group pretty much at the point. This is one of the long stages, Brian. It's 200 kilometers. And uh, it has a little bit of uh, climbing in the middle. And uh, Ben Pouillen is uh, somewhat flat. As the camera sweeps up and down this lead group here, you see Ron Kiefel, Paolo, competing as part of the 7-Eleven team in the Giro d'Italia, the 68th Giro d'Italia. Ron Kiefel, an outstanding American rider that uh, would appear to have the tools to make himself into a, a good professional in the European mold. Leading this little group, Ron Kiefel, the American on the 11th stage of the Giro d'Italia. As you can see, their group is uh, right on their heels, and uh, it doesn't seem like it's really going to pick this breakaway. No, nope, there you got the uh, old group together again. So we're setting up for what could appear to be another one of those mad, mad dashes to the finish, and uh, we're looking at now what would appear to be a counter with trains on one side, cars on the other, and the riders going down the middle. There's one of the 7-Eleven jerseys at the front of the... That's the, Eric, isn't it? It's yeah. Eric Hyden. That's correct. And easy to spot because of his, his size. He's certainly one of the largest bicycle racers anywhere around, physically large. Eric did quite well in this year, by the way, winning the uh, Hot Spots uh, competition. These are the special sprints along the along the road. Here is Borjaca, so he's also an unusual uh, individual. He's Colombian, but he's just as blonde as they come. And uh, races with the Colombian team, has competed a number of times in the United States, has earned medals in the Course Classic, and we see him now. I think that uh, Eric attributed the shape rode himself into by riding the for his win at the uh, U.S. Pro Championship. Is that correct? Very, very much so. I think that the fitness that he gained while he was in Europe is what gave him needed to get a very deserving victory. He did not luck into or act into that professional championship victory in Philadelphia. He he earned it very definitely. He was in the in all the right places at the right time. He was in the winning breakaway, and he by the time got he got close to the finish line was uh, very definitely the most powerful sprinter of the of the breakaway group. Eric Hyden, we're speaking of, of course, really made the transition to a racing cyclist that he began after the 1980 Olympics where he won finals on speed skates. And there was Chris Carmichael, another 11. Uh, I know Chris quite well because he's from uh, South Florida. As a matter of fact, he's uh, right here in Miami. And uh, I remember Chris uh, almost when he started riding. He's a very gutsy rider, a good rider, and uh, has proven himself to be quite valuable to the team, the 7-Eleven team, while uh, doing the Giro. Another rider who has distinguished himself quite well domestically and has now made a very clear transition to an international professional rider. There's really a, a legitimate professional class in the United States. There are riders who have made themselves turn pro and have raced in Europe and are also racing in the United States as professionals and have made a legitimate transition to a pro class. And Chris Carmichael is one of those. It seems like we're pretty close to look at the, uh, the people at the overpass. I mean, there's traffic jam right at that overpass, people just stopping to see the riders go by. And here a little reel of riders has gained maybe 100 yards or so on the rest of the field and as quickly as we say that with another one dash finishes with uh, no clear winner, obvious, but... We had Sony there, and we had Froiler and uh, Alokio. Alokio is a uh, uh, rider from... Uh, here. That's the guy who's leading now. He's a first-year pro, Stefan Alokio, and uh, he won two stages of the Giro this year. He then went on to uh, win the silver medal at the points race, the professional points race. 
He rides for the um, the Bottega Pirelli team. Same team as the Silva. On the far left of the screen is uh, is Freuler. Freuler, correct. And the winner to the right of the screen, just to Freuler's left, is Stener Alokio. Another great, uh, great dash uh, sprint finish there. Well, now we're going to the 12, which is an individual time trial, 38 kilometers. Here's Cerrone of uh, Del Tonga and with a time trial to try to gain back time on the leaders. As we had mentioned several stages ago, Cerrone pretty much out of contention in terms of overall victory, but he'll nevertheless use his skills. Here's Moser, probably the premier time trialist using a, a disc rear wheel at this point and wear number one, the defending champion. This, by the way, is not a flat time trial. There is uh, there's two little rises, and one of them is fairly significant. Uh, it goes from uh, 48 meters to 71 meters. Here we have Renault, I mean, uh, Bernino with his uh, look. Patterned after ski bindings that are unique, and uh, probably the best non-toe clip and strap system that's yet been devised at least uh, apparently it's a good idea that you're able to kick out of them by just twisting your foot to the side almost like a ski bike but they're very easy to get on and uh, your foot is not totally trapped in there it's actually a very valid uh, system I believe that they're going to be marketed in the United States by Descent. And uh, I think that uh, if they're not already available, they should be quite soon. Uh, at least from what I understand, towards the end of this year, they will be available in this country. Here we see the, the, the current leader's time is Nedeman, and we see uh, Giovannetti of Italy beating that time to, to take the lead at this point in the time trial competition with many of the competitors yet to finish. Here's Moser wearing the number one and riding that disc rear wheel bike. Very, very smooth style. Uh, it's a lot to be said by watching the professional leaders and how they carry themselves on their bicycle. Read and heard about them for so many years and now we've had an opportunity to actually see them doing them better than anyone in the world. Also one, of the, one of the top riders for many years and is now has an example for many American riders who have worshipped this man for years and here they go to Europe in his uh, home court and are make it name themselves some of the Americans. Here are he's using both the front and rear wheels and uh, with the uh, whatever they have written on actually the optical illusion that they're certainly not uh, very round but uh, I guess uh, these things uh, are as round as they come and these disc wheels are a little bit different from the ones that uh, Mos uses. Uh, these are a lot than Moser's disc wheels. Uh, they, and that's the reason why he used them in spot. There is a little bit of climbing on this time trial. Because I know that climbing with those disc wheels is extremely, extremely difficult. I have found them several times. And once you get the uh, momentum going, they're very, very effective, but to climb them is, is an additional weight that you definitely don't need, particularly in something that turns, where you actually would like to save weight in, uh, in uh, any kind of a climbing situation. In the of truth, Bernardi now certainly another great time trial. He has earned himself victories, many say by virtue of his time trialing ability. And uh, here he is in that, in that race of the race of truth. There's Vincentini now, the overall leader in the pink team, and will do his bit to defend Jersey with an individual clock. He is the last rider, and uh, the reason why is because on the stage races, on time trials, they start uh, in reverse order. Uh, the classification. So uh, he knows was a previous rider, and now Vicentini is the one that uh, takes it in. Now this can be good and it can be bad, Brian, because sometimes you have weather conditions changing from the beginning to the end. There are so many riders, 150 riders, you probably have starting here at least in minute, minute and a half intervals. We're talking about the uh, difference of a couple of hours between the uh, riders and the uh, end riders, and uh, weather conditions can change considerably. Here we have a, a rider coming into finish. Cerrone, then. And this is Cerrone, and as we can see, he has not gained or has not earned a victory at this particular stage. The technique going in reverse general classic order is also uh, twofold. It's very interesting for the fans because there's go later. By the way, that was Moser. Here we Moser now. Post fan. Uh, I had a prim time there. Moser does 4728, and uh, so is the current leader. But the first general class order is interesting, and it's also useful for the riders because they know how fast they have to go. And here's Ian demonstrating his time trial priority. He is doing 46.30 and has beat the time of by nearly a full minute. So Bernardo, a decisive uh, situation for him. 
as he comes in to a very, very fast time. Now Greg Mont, similarly, racing here, comes in, is not going to be his teammate, you know, in the trial, but it's a very fast time, nevertheless, and will move up in the standing. This teeny, you can see now the time for him, 48-12 against Eno's 46-30. Could very be enough for Eno to take the overall lead in the value for 1985. Oh, no, that's, that's not enough, uh, Brian, because uh, what he needed, to remember, was 28 seconds, and uh, here he's taken uh, two minutes. So, uh, and there you can see standings that Eno has, in fact, has in fact uh, moved in uh, and you actually have then uh, Moser moved into second uh, position and uh, Le Mans moved into uh, third I think Vicentini has been relegated to uh, fifth or sixth and here is Eno donning the pink jersey and Magna Rosa Bernard Eno will be the race leader now in the 68th Giro d'Italia and will be with the strength of his La Vie Claire team, a very, very tough man to unseat for the overall victory. Well, we're moving on to uh, stage number 10, and uh, the riders are looking at 154 kilometers from Medaloni to Frosinone. And this is a relatively flat stage. Uh, it's, it's a little broken up at the end, but it's uh, overall it's uh, really flat. The leader here is Carol, and he is making it to be a lone picture of a solo winner in Italian to take his victory. It is very hard for it, and as you can see, has, is at least out of sight of the peloton at this point. Uh, that's a good shot there. I'm sure the, the, the road is standing to go up, and uh, he's just really working at, uh, at uh, muscling those gears. And Spatolero, not a top name rider, but nevertheless, okay. doing a fine job. At 20 kilometers from the finish, we have now riders that are away. And they, there was one of the hot spots there, apparently one of the hot spots or climbing special prizes with a banner over the road, which is why the, the speed had picked up very briefly at that point. Now the riders are sick into more of a cooperative effort. Four of them seem to be doing that, while a counterattack here has been launched by one of the five riders in that group. And you can see perhaps why, because the peloton is very, very close indeed to catching that breakaway. The lone rider in front feeling as though if he can make an attack and get away from the small break, that he alone may not be caught if the field catches the, his, his breakaway companions. They may ignore that he has been out. Here we have uh, a situation where they're actually coming down on the um, sprint, and uh, we're probably within a kilometer or so of the finish line. We have the teams uh, setting up. We have the yellow del Tongos. Uh, I'm sure they're trying to move Cerrone up. Uh, and here we have uh, the actual finish. There's, there's looks like Froiler. There's Froiler again, sure enough. And that uh, blue and white uh, Atala jerk, his hands in the air, another stage win for a fellow that's one, certainly one of the best in the business. You can see Freuler on the left of the screen, powering his way to the line. He takes a glance down between his arms where if there was a rider close to him, he would be able to see the wheel or the shadow, at least, of someone behind him, close behind him. Now he takes a, a full panorama view of the rest of the field and seeing no one challenge him for the sprint puts his hands in the air and has done job in earning a stage victory for his team and for himself. He certainly won this one handling, Brian. He, uh, there's no nobody really contesting the sprint with him, not, not at least no like, dangerously close. There he actually looked back and that he had enough time to raise his own ticket easy. Full bike length clear of the second place rider. And with that stage win, takes the... Uh, Don's the, the maroon jersey. There is the white jersey of the best young pro and another of the special jerseys, the green one. This one is stage number 14, 195 kilometers. And here we're going to see climbing. Now the jersey uh, is uh, going north at this point and they're actually going right through the center of the building. In so doing, they're going to be facing quite a, quite a bit of climbing. Now here we have, uh, in this stage, there is four uh, mountain creams, the last one of which is the actual finish line. That, what that means is the uh, finish line is considered a mountain cream uh, insofar as the wings are concerned. They're definitely the mountains with a thin descent, and uh, these, these switchback ends provide some, some thrills, chills, and spills. They 
Ryder appears to be fortunate in that it's dry, and you can see that the switchbacks enable the lead group to look up to the side of themselves and see any chase that might make it this way. The Ryder's doing an S probably 55 to 60 miles an hour at this point. Motorcycles with their hands full to keep up with the racing bicyclists. There's Or Hawk, Colombian, easy to spot in uh, his jersey with the blonde hair and one of the Del Tongo yellow jerseys on a very, very fast ascent. That rider is Panin. You probably remember him from the, uh, the tour last year. Roberto Panin. A good finishing, a good sprinter, a good finishing sprinter, and, uh, and here put himself well at the descent. This, this uh, stage has obviously broken the field up pretty here. It's a little all, all over the road in this downhill portion of the course. The climb has broken it up, and the different abilities of riders to descent to it's where the, the brave guy really come on to have that special bravado to be able to say rapidly to use their brave as possible to corner and hang it out on the hairy edge, to speak, to go downhill very fast. Merckx was always quite a confident ability. Here's Lamar. Uh, descending well, and is a is a good downhill rider. To many. That's uh, George we were thinking earlier. This is the Cody uh, look, and uh, he's a very very good climb and uh, took a good lead on the uh, climb. And now he's trying to maintain it. This. The only guy who's been able to stop him is a fellow named Giuliani, which is a uh, most serious uh, trusted lieutenant. I very second role in the state that was won by Andy Hampstead because he's the uh, one that uh, first lost his uh, helped him uh, going up hill without uh, really falling off the pace. And there's a man that we were speaking of on another climb at this point. Yeah, this is a climb that is leading to the finish, uh, Brian. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, actual finish itself is uh, is going to be considered towards a uh, mountain cream uh, price. Here's the final kilometer banner. I guess there's one kilometer, six tenths of a mile remaining to the finish. He's got about a 8 second lead on the main group. Uh, there is a couple of rocks in between him and the group, but uh, the group is 8 seconds behind. Looks like a stage win. Stay in alone, which is this is a finishing climb, 15 kilometers. So uh, he's actually higher 15 kilometers himself with a group at uh, anywhere between uh, 30 and 45 seconds behind. That's that's not an easy thing to do for 15 kilometers. You know, you, you have to work hard because you know the guy behind not taking it easy. You can see that uh, over five and a half hours, how long it has taken the wind behind. That's his margin of victory showing the right side of the screen. That this is Michael Wilson, by the way. The man. Seconds behind the leader of the bunch. Spring. And Moser uh, got the third place there. And now the rest of the riders who were part of the group will just cross the line, knowing that they will receive the same time, which, which is 20 seconds and the winner's time. Here's uh, our stage winner. Attraversando 200 kilometers or 120 miles across. And here is one of the 7-Eleven jerseys. This is Bob Roll showing himself at the front. He's a good sized rider. Follow your attention. Himself at the at a tour by winning a stage in Bail. This is going to be a very significant race for uh, U.S. Uh, cycling, uh, Brian Enzi. There's a good ball. And the riders, one by one, themselves in the picture. Showing some styles of the various riders. Not only the physiques, but the riding styles of the riders are shown very graphic by moving from one rider to another, as they have just done with a great motorcycle shot here. Here we have uh, uh, the same that uh, was uh, with Chochli yesterday, the, that I mentioned was a very good uh, Stigo Moser. Now it seems like Moser has got his team up front. Keeping the pace fast and the, the tech that is in this manner is usually indicative of the team wanting to minimize other teams' abilities to attack or to to any time. Here we see Bob Roll again, significant. Seven team was sponsored by Hoop, computer manufacturers in Europe. It's the first time that an American team 
compete in the international stage race. But next year, of course, they, into 1986, put a team in the Tour de France as well. Well, he's certainly taking his pulse. He's, uh, he's not, uh, not riding anybody's wheel. He's doing his share of the work, without a doubt. Of course, the group is right at their heels, so it doesn't look like uh, they're finishing a, in a book. There's a classic counterattack by Kiefer. On his heels, we have Gary Knetterman. And Knetterman, as you might call, was a winner of the World Championships a few years back, formerly with uh, Raleigh. He had a very, very bad accident two years ago, and uh, he's here getting uh, back onto shape again. So Kiefer and Knetterman, certainly Ron Kiefer was an admirer of... Uh, of uh, Jerry Knedeman, the young American now in as a, of Knedeman. Well, I don't think that there was much of a partnership here because uh, Knedeman has been on keep wheel the entirety of the, of the little attempt. They look up the road to their advantages, almost neutral at this point, but they're in the final kilometer of the race, and Kiefel is not looking back at all. Knedeman is content to take a side on the wheel of the tall uh, Colorado American here. He comes to the bunch, the, the green jersey and the purple jersey. Pretty severe corner there, just before the end. As you can see, Fulton have been leading the whole time. He's pretty well outdistanced Knedeman. He started his sprint. Knedeman is in a good position to to take a run at him at the finish, but Eagles looking down under his under his arm there, making sure that he uh, can see if Knedeman is make a move on him, and he does not. Ron Keefel now earned the most very significant stick for an American besides Greg Lon. Greg Lon, of course, and by himself uh, for a number of now in Europe. Here is another American rider winning a stage in a major national Stage Rio to tell you, Ron Kiefel's chance to spray the campaign and enjoy a little bit of Very, very significant victory for the United States and for the uh, team. There you can see the margin of victory, some 10 right in the final announce. He just pulled it. I mean, uh, he certainly earned that win. Here we are at the second stage, so about 217 kilometers just to Chich day after day riding sets of 100 miles it is a relatively flat stage but uh, toward uh, the last uh, 30 40 quarters of climbs in it. Uh, not very significant however here we have what is her move in a race by riders who for one reason or another see to gate from the field including Ronnie Claire riders and uh, this little hill nine kilometers on the finish at this point Lately in the race, this is in fact quite late in the race, and this little trio of uh, looking perhaps to earn themselves a measure of uh, fame and fortune by winning the stage of Italia. There we see uh, Gino Pink, Jersey, the race leader, tucked in the middle of the field with many of his teammates around him. One of his teammates, in fact, in that, in that little breakaway tree. So we have uh, three men leading uh, the stage at this point, and then we have uh, the group right behind, and as we can see, Moser has got his uh, boys working, and uh, we see at least uh, the top five, the top front six riders, or five riders, are from the uh, GIS uh, team. Seems like uh, Moser probably had the intention of winning this stage, and uh, he put his men up front to uh, reel in the uh, breakaway. There is the break right now, as they over their shoulders a bit early. Now, you, these guys are working, uh, Brian. Uh, I mean, it's, and also one thing that is very significant is the length pulls that they take. It's not, uh, they're not taking, uh, you know, 100-yard pulls or 50-yard pulls. They go to the front and they pull for maybe half a kilometer or something like that and sustain the speed. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. And different, I think, from racing here in America where if there's a breakaway of four or five riders uh, on a one-mile course, they'll each take two or three pulls per lap. Here the riders are obviously taking much longer pulls than that. You can see the distance between the breakaway now and the field and uh, you know those eat them alive at the finish situations. In fact, here, here comes the peloton right past those three riders and it'll be a very despairing thing if you're out there working for 40 or 50 miles only to be swallowed up within a few kilometers of the finish. There we have Da Silva in third position there with his uh, green jersey. And, and Vanderbilt right, almost right behind them. And Freuler. Right. Now there you have a sick move. There you have the uh, man right behind the seal of slowing down and letting that gap open up. Now, you have a uh, Atala rider who's convinced that he's got Freuler on his wheel, except he's got the seal. And you're going to see when he turns around and sees it as the silver there, he's just in utter disgust. 
because he's convinced that he's got his teammate Florida right behind him. So here you go. He turned around, Morandi turns around and realizes that he's not his teammate. So it, uh, what he appeared, but he's a tactical uh, bit of genius and turned out to be quite a blunder, committing Silva rival to another injury. But not, not that. Uh, the Silva, as you can see, gets eaten up here. Yes, he's the line. And we have, there's a ray of sight here this time. We have a Del Tongo yellow jersey here. And it's Saron. Uh, that that was uh, that was quite a sprint, uh, Brian. Because that speed was top end from. I think that they were at top end at 200 meters from the finish. Look, here There's, we go. Cerrone will be right behind them. There's and, the Silva, who was cut to the line by the time he had gotten there in this lead out. And in third, we have a 7-11 jersey. And it's probably yes, it is. It appears to be Dave Finney. You'll see him fade, though, I believe. Right. That's what we were talking about that he mentioned in that interview. Is that he just doesn't have that acceleration. Now notice how Cerrone is still accelerating away from him. Well, actually, Finney does appear to hold on for third, while Cerrone, as you say, accelerating away from even Finney, who in this country is, uh, no one accelerates away from Davis Finney in the United States. A perfect example the difference between the abilities of the rider and what green states exists in Europe. Okay, we're on 17, 240 kilometers, and this is go from China to Mona, as you might know, for Ferrari. Made. A group of riders working together here. Nice echelon being executed. These riders, they appear to be taking short pulls not like described here as they each will move in an echelon there's a bit of a crosswind right well you've got an riders here to have an echelon when you have three riders or, or a double pace line in essence when you have three riders you have to find yourself the fact that they can long pull right, one of the riders is apparently having a mechanical problem the far he holds his hand up he's holding his left hand up indicating flat air probably a front flat no I believe that what he's asking for the, uh, the team, team car to come over and what they do see they notify one of the motorcycles now the motorcycle turn notifies the uh, vehicle, and then the team vehicle is allowed to come up to the rider. Uh, that's usually the, uh, the uh, standard here. You first know the motorcycle because the motorcycles are always nearby, not just the uh, camera motorcycle, but they have this bike very close to the rider. They so notify the uh, team car, authorize, in essence, authorize the team car to come to the front. Now, today's Eve, uh, from what I'm listening, the Italian player is that uh, he's asking for some uh, food. It's 243 kilometers, and it seems like this breakaway has been away for quite some time now, so uh, I think that there at some point uh, where it still would be worthwhile to eat something so that he might have some uh, some extra fuel there for the finish. There, in fact, was the team car pulling up next to the rider who had requested it. This is an example of an echelon or double pace line working quite well. You can see the riders will pull in wind while the riders advancing will, will move up on the, uh, the windward side, so to speak, and a very, very smooth little unit here that can make a tremendous amount of speed. And they're doing their job, you know, they're taking their pulls. Nobody's trying to uh, sit in the back uh, and uh, get a free ride out of it. Other than perhaps briefly to, to take or something and move right back to the rotation. This is the, uh, the chase group. Uh, apparently there's a chase group behind that breakaway, and this is the chair. And they're not as well organized as you can see. This, this group here is kind of in shambles. No one is making a, an organized effort to, to keep this group moving. You can see that the guy that just, the rider in the yellow that just pulled off the front, uh, two riders behind into the line. So on paper at least, or obviously that group would have less chance of gaining ground than the, uh, the lead group, which is very well together. Here's Eno in the pink jersey, the race leader, and his teammates surrounding him. Right, there's certainly there. He's got, uh, I think, two in front and one behind, just about, so he's in good company. There's the, uh, the Neo Pro, the white jersey of the best first year professional rider. He's actually for the team, the team car as well. And here's the last, the last bit to the finish line. Apparently, one of the guys uh, was able to uh, get away from that breakaway. Actually, they're breaking up because I see another rider, uh, almost two riders uh, behind them. There's a stage win. Yeah, I, it makes sense that Gissinger would be the one to uh, get away from them because Gissinger is uh, a excellent time trial. And I see like in the last few kilometers, he just took a fire from the breakaway. There's uh, the Swift the team, Fostaken was the Italian team with the blue jersey. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Del Tongo, the first of that little 
Breakaway grouping in for the, for the remaining places in the field. In the distance, way distance. Oh, here, and a half. exactly, yeah. Already been riding for 6 hours, 28 minutes at that point. And we have yet to see the line. This is the main peloton with most of the contending riders in it. Meanwhile, the, the stage winner is uh, already enjoying the champagne. We have the friend here. Almost 10 minutes behind. The time on the right is the time behind the leaders. Now oh. Bernardi know the race leader joins the stage winner. Obviously, there was nobody, no danger man in that boy. Otherwise, I'm sure they wouldn't have let her go for 10 minutes. And here we have uh, stage number 18, and from Monza, where the uh, famed uh, automobile racetrack is, to uh, Domodossola. It's 128 kilometers, so it's a relatively short stage. Bernardino with the pink jersey. Number 81. Relatively flat, I may add, uh, Brian. And they appear to be rolling along on a bit of a descent, or certainly a flat, flat section here along the river. And the pound pretty much attacked at this point. There's most are making a big effort front right now. Now, at this point, uh, Hino was pretty much shadowing any move that Moss made because uh, there was uh, not much time for any the other. So uh, it was in uh, Hino's best to make sure that he kept Moss close at bay. Here. Close shots. There's some of Moss Air's teammates in the air now. Del Tom with this is my friend Loro, uh, that I mentioned, uh, comes out and rides with us quite often. Gary Kinetterman, Greg Lamont. Apparently that we call the, uh, the, uh, the team car, we got, I know the motorcycle, pedestrian. Yeah, and uh, yeah, here we Apparently Greg had called the team car. Last kilometer, and again, uh, being a flat stage, we're going to have a heck of a sprint. You can see the pace picking up front. The first few riders in single file. And sprint begins at Excel Line. The lead out teams working uh, to get their third man up front. At this point, uh, it, it, is, it is Harry, <laughs> to say the least. It is very Harry at this point. The fans who seem to enjoy pelting the riders with uh, whatever. And that's Vosel. Of some kind. Vosel again, Brian. Froiler. Froiler in second, yeah. You see it uh, in slow motion, probably. Froiler is the one who's leading it out in the front. And Rosla may move from third and uh, accelerates quite well to the opposite side of the road, the green, left side of the road. Froiler is led front and has hoped to use his speed and power to hold off anyone, but Rosla has uh, the accelerate and with Froiler fading a bit, throws like Rosla has enough to stage win. You know, with another attempt of big flowers into the crowd, and now Rosla is the, the victory champagne. And that's held with the uh, purple jersey. Okay, 19th stage, but also in 107 kilometers, 150 miles And here we got two significant climbs, one right off uh, the very beginning, and uh, then we're going to have another one fairly close to the finish. You know, descending the here we have Moser at the uh, and uh, uh, when uh, the, uh, the commentator was mentioning that uh, several times during this this Moser tried to get away from Hino but to uh, absolutely no avail. Here we see Greg doing some attempt at uh, descending in a rather non-conventional and here we have the other riders pretty much concerned with Greg LeMond's dynamic coasting style has now been abandoned by Greg himself. That's Ferroni, by the way. To turn his hat around and get the brim down on his neck, so it's more aerodynamic there. He's very concerned with that. So here's Moser with what, what is pretty much a trademark for him. We see him with his hat turned backwards like the quite often. And certainly, on the other hand, prefers to wear it forward with the 
By the way, Monsieur is acknowledged to be one of the best defenders in Italy, and um, he uh, he has actually, uh, in a way, on many crucial occasions, uh, right out of descent. Of course, when he raced with Eddie Merckx, that was not, he was not going to make up any ground on a descent to Merckx. Merckx, who was, uh, is one of the best enders in the world, and of all time, was fearless on the hills. And because he was also quite heavy, he was able to use inertia to, to go much better on, on straighter portions of downhill runs. And some of the lighter riders he was able to make up a lot of ground downhill that he perhaps would lose going uphill. There's the green jersey of the sprint leader to Silva in the middle of the peloton. Wind into the finish. Eno and Le Mans, particularly having a little chit chat. Discuss some strategy perhaps in this race. Immediately afterwards, you're going to see uh, certain uh, weights doing it quite so. It seems like a uh, for tat, so to speak. Game plan lie. Uh, they all speak each other's language, so they have to do it pretty pretty cleverly, I would say, or use a, a, a dialect they would hope the other to understand if they can. Here's the final kilometer now to the, to the finish. Whatever discussed will now be will be executed, uh, hopefully. At that point, uh, right after Mosar gets with his teammate, is when he attempts to take care. I don't know if that was part of the session or what. They're right across the uh, last yeah, color banner. Yes, they're in the final kilometer. Okay. And one rider just meters off, as you can see. The field. No one rider. It looks like, like it's slightly uphill, you know. Now the field is beginning to get a bit more animated, and this one rider he is going to evaporate oh, now, make, uh, make presence on the right side of the road. We see the purple jersey bend in the middle. Now the, the sprint again in earnest. I see Moser there on the right. And, uh, and he's a good gap. It's Moser making a good gallop. It looks like he's made it good enough to win. With Van de Velde behind, it is uh, going to be Francesco Moser who's going to save six and a half hours. Here we see it in slow yeah. There's that acceleration that, you, that we have spoken of so many times, that acceleration to the finish. Well, set one, you see the purple jersey of Van de behind him, and fourth there is the white jersey of the pro leader. Volpe is his name, yeah. Volpe. Uh, yellow del Tongo, could that be Sarai? So when it comes down to a finish, the big will go to the front. It's no accident there either, huh? Here's Moser now, opportunity to, to douse the crowd. There's Van de Velde in the Purple Climbers jersey, the climbing competition. Now we're looking at a stage, and this is uh, the same stage that uh, was very, very significant cycling. This is a stage that was uh, won by the Hempstead, and you're going to see exactly the makes move. Short stage, it was 8 kilometers long, and uh, approximately half of the stage was, uh, no, not half, but up kilometer number 33, it was all flat. From kilometer 33 to kilometer 58, which we're talking about 25 miles, it was climbing. They're definitely climbing at this point. And Jersey of Mio is at the front of, of the field. Bernardi already know who at this point had won four tours to front and is the best of Italian. And there we have Tommy Prim and uh, Malajarreta. And climb front now. And there's Hampton. There's Hampton's move, yeah. Hampton. He rides here in the United States. Now this was played, Brian. I don't know if I read some of the commentary. But this was and, uh, between him and Mike Neal. They decided that at a certain point, when there was a sign on the road or something, he was going to uh, take a shot at it. And that's exactly what he did. At that point, where there was a sign on the road, he, uh, a specific sign that they had uh, preached, uh, he took off and uh, he made it stick. No question about it. Here is Greg uh, facing after. And as you can see, the road is pretty steep at this point. Huh? Greg Lawn, you know, a, real, a real hard effort out of the saddle. He and Andy Hampton know each other quite well, have trained together quite a bit, raced against each other in a, when they were both younger and now in Europe. So here Lamont says, even if the rest of you guys don't know about this Hampton fellow, I certainly did. He can and will ride away from us if we let him. And that is what is going on. 
Coman is now being back. He was by La Jarretta. And there's a rest field led by Vol. Now, this is Giuliani, Brian. Remember that I mentioned to you, uh, Monsieur Domestique uh, Giuliani, that said that he's the one that basically pays the hog and minimizes the losses uh, of the uh, peloton in this stage. There he is. It looks like there's the uh, Volpe. But now there's Le Mans, a very good, clear picture of Greg Le Mans, the great American professional. And uh, here's Giuliani again. Switching quickly to Giuliani. La Jarretta. I read that must have attacked six, seven times on this line. It was just one attack after the other. He finally did come in second place. And uh, uh, he was without, but you know, not with Sanya. Andy, he was definitely the most aggressive rider at the stage. Predetermined attack point or not, it worked perfectly for Hampson, at least up to this point in time, because he literally caught everybody fancy. And uh, just field has Hampson attacked very strong. Has gained a very large gap on the on the now in the final kilometer, the final few meters. Very very happy the Hampson. I must mention too that uh, Andy was not a danger, so consequently he know and uh, and uh, Moser and uh, and uh, Heck, uh, would not go to the very energy to chase him down because he was not really a danger. And, uh, been a, I would imagine it would have been a different race together if he would have been one of the one of the top generation. Never he made a very fine that has earned himself a stage victory in the Euro in history, being now one of two Americans to do in stages in the Euro 1985. Well, later on, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but he went to uh, an invitational um, Thrown up is a uh, time trial hill climb, uh, which is uh, invitational to the Italian uh, a specific number of them get invited. And he was invited by virtue of having won this stage race. And uh, he went ahead and won this uh, invitational hill climb time trial. There he is. Consecrated as only a world class. He's followed that with forms in the American Tour, the American National Tour, the first class. It's uh, the only competition that Greg LeMond had in in that event, and Easton, with virtually no support, at least not on the classification, was able to uh, be the aggressor in the climbing part in his climb aisles, very, very obviously uh, that of, of a world-class climber. Well, even after that went on to Colombia, which is uh, the country that additionally has the best climbers and won a climbing uh, race. Over very confident in his abilities in that comes, I think, it's just added to what he already physically. Okay, here we're at age 21, and it's 209 kilometers. And we're looking at uh, the last of the stages, last chance for the, uh, for the sprinters. They appear to be taking the opportunity, taking the opportunity in, uh, in hand right now, a solo rider. And uh, apparently there's red, white, and green. Seven jerseys in second position in the field there. And another one, three riders back from that. It's Hayden, perhaps, at the front. Yeah, it's Hayden at the front, right. And perhaps the fifth rider in the, in the, uh, in the single line here. A rompere i cambi, a fare il gioco di squadra, questi americani. Riders so. are sì, in late in the Giro d'Italia to, qui, che to uh, tutti exhibit the abilities that we have po, seen, we feel as though they have, and they are fare. getting used e to this, qui, this kind of racing now and, and are showing their abilities. You can see that we're getting close to the finish line by the size of the crowd. The question is, will this, will this rider be able to hold off the charging field? Will he be swallowed up as we've seen so many before? The sprint really begins. We By the way, Brian, that rider was Hayden, uh, the one that was away up front. And then there were other Americans that were uh, some uh, team tactics. There's Hayden just now. This apparently goes uphill here at the finish. Yeah, it's a great at the finish from what I can see uh, in the uh, map here. The more light and green is getting in front of the Peloton. Tom now has uh, one man clearly off that goal. There you see a number of what train is coming here late in the race. Now we're within the lap and uh, we've got the others getting ready for this. Again, spurt third miles of movement. And there's somebody really rocketing out of the field. Whoops. Again, I'm looking at the very, very happy. Taken the final opportunity for a field sprintery and turned it into just that. There's for a rider on the Italian team. And he is just simply a magnificent field, tremendous turnover. Two world championship titles in 1985. One of the carriers of the race, Evan Davis, and he putting himself in a familiar place, and that is at the front. 
and spin up in America and a 50 mile high chain that's in the chair of the and a We're coming on to say, by the way, that's the America West Fuji, which is the, um, uh, I believe in the United States we have uh, more winning ships with the uh, Naval Academy. That's uh, the economy. This is a time trial. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do well in the middle of that. Then all the way to the finish line. But uh, that, uh, I'm not sure. And it will take the uh, pink jersey from the uh, you know, This being the last stage, it was the last opportunity that he had. We're going to separating these two riders. If not, impossible. Here's this general classification. You can see that Bernardi knows how to do it. Better than anyone else who's going to race between two of the time trials in the world. He's wearing the uh, pink jersey. Well, sir, was uh, uh, kind of hopeful that he could do a uh, higher round. He's not going to come to track. Bernardi knows that he's going to defend the pink jersey on the final day. Showing that Rodolfo over a distance of his time trial ability has constantly stood in the group as a fighting losing battle this morning for the tie to now they just announced the third uh, point of time, which is 14. So that's 32, 50 seconds for 20 kilometers. Either of us can go. Maybe even a bit far, right? Down hill with a little pocket. Here's Sino. Going faster, yes. Okay, we're going to announce the halfway uh, time for Hino. Exactly the same, uh, 2 14, exactly to the second at the same time. So the plan for needs to make up, he's going to have half of the race, and uh, the chances of doing that they have, if he knows able to match the speed of the Eagles jersey, and this time, uh, in fact, what uh, appears to be most early, you can see here's the time trial, and there it is, in first place time, at that point. 59, 57, which is the right speed, with an excess of 48 kilometers, which is 30 miles an hour. No, no, no. Most of time on the top was time to run at 59 and 30. And uh, if he's faster than me, he defends it. If he, even if he's slower, but 15 seconds, and he will hold it. So he's already won. And Muster is there as king and watching. And essentially, you know, I'm... He's going to the finish at this point. He has won 285. Bernard, you know. And to the finish. The third. Where of it? There's his time, as you can see, seven seconds slower than Moser. And better than a minute. Better than a minute. He's going to be faster for the entire race. So with these seven news, we're leaving you with uh, this recap of the uh, 68th Dearly Italia, and we hope that uh, next year you'll be interested in uh, watching this famous uh, stage race, second only to the Tour de France.